Hello and welcome to tonight's presentation, the three big mistakes most people make in small stakes tournaments. My name is Evan Jarvis and I'll be your host. And note, if you have questions, please write them down and I'll answer them at the end of the presentation because I have a feeling there's going to be at least one or two questions. We're going fairly deep on some pretty powerful concepts and there's a very high likelihood that some of this information is going to be new to some of you. And, um, you know, I want to make sure that you get as much clarification as possible on the concept so you can implement them into your game most easily and get the best results possible from applying them. So with um, kind of the map of the territory laid out, let's get into the action and let's get stacking. Oh, and by the way, by the end of this webinar, you will have learned how to stop making mistakes which are costing you tournaments and start building stacks and winning more tournaments. So quick introduction about me so you can know who I am if it's your first time meeting me. Uh, my name is Evan Jarvis in 2004 after Chris Moneymaker you know, won the old main event and we saw that epic bluff between he and Sammy Farah. I started playing poker, started playing with sit and goes, felt like it was the easiest way to build a bankroll and it was the format that allowed me to get the most play for my dollar. You know, I could put in five bucks, get a nice big start and stack and get 30 to 60 minutes of play and I just thought that was fantastic. Uh, in 2008, after studying uh, a lot of cash game content on card runners and some tournament stuff on Poker X Factor back in the day, I graduated college and I moved out to play cash games full time for my living with my roommate, John Nixon, who has uh, become a very savvy investor himself. 2012, my roommate, who I had met the year before, thanks to a lucky break, Greg Merson, uh, won the main event and I had a 2% swap with him. I also cashed the main event that year, finishing 240th place for about $40,000, and I was hooked on multi-table tournaments after this event. So in 2013, I decided to shift my focus from cash games to tournaments. I found that after getting a really big score, cash games had kind of lost their excitement, and you know I wanted that thrill, so I began studying MTTs so that I could recreate the feeling that I had in the summer of 2012. At this time, I invited a lot of the best players in the world, uh, like Griffin Bencher and Calvin Anderson, to move into my apartment so that I could study under their tutelage and become the best tournament player that I could be. I also started teaching at this time on my YouTube channel, Gripst, because I knew that teaching is the best way to learn, and I wanted to save what I was picking up from these master roommates. I didn't want to lose it. So, you know, the same way I'm encouraging y'all to write down your questions and your key takeaways from this presentation. I thought that to put it into video form was the best way to save as much of that information as I could. And you can find a lot of those videos and teachings on my YouTube channel, Gripst. So in 2016, I had my first major test of success uh, when I chopped the World Poker Tour Falls View Classic for $162,000. And that dream came true, you know, of wanting to get that big win, experience the rush and that feeling um, after having a couple of $10,000 scores in the previous two years. And I know on the check it says 95000 That's because on paper I took third place, but we made a deal when I was three-handed as the chip leader, and I took home $162,000 for my efforts on a $1,000 tournament investment. It was an incredible feeling, an incredible rush, and still to this day, I've done a lot of things, and nothing quite compares to the feeling of winning a big massive multi-table multi-day tournament there were over a thousand i think there were 1600 entrants in that tournament something huge uh, in 2007 i final tabled my first world series of poker event the hard work and studying continued to pay off uh, albeit an online event it still felt pretty cool to final table a world series of poker event it's always been a dream of mine to play you know, a World Series of Poker final table and have a shot at a bracelet. And I came pretty close finishing fourth place for 74,000. And once again, I got, you know, that feeling, that rush that I was craving from tournament poker. And, you know, the money that came with it wasn't bad either. And finally, in 2018, things went full circle. Um, some of the guys who started out at micro stakes watching Grips videos when, you know, I started putting them out back in 2012 and 2013, they started breaking out and becoming some of the biggest winners out there. So you may have heard of them. Ali Msirovich, um, 
he's a poker master champion last year and Charlie Carroll, who's just all over the place. I think he's got over 8 million in winnings at this point and counting. So now I saw the benefits of teaching and offering my knowledge to other people out there was that now I got to sit back and watch my students getting the results and I get to enjoy the show of kind of being that proud father figure, you know, seeing how the kids have grown up and now they're just running the show. And I really hope that you know, through the teachings that I offer you, you're going to be able to do the same. And I'm going to be able to watch you on your big wins, whether they're live final tables that are streamed or they're online events. And I really look forward to receiving emails from you guys as well. And, you know, maybe even joining you with the global poker awards when you win your breakout player of the year award. Um, so we're about to get into the, the meat and potatoes of it, but I I'd just like you to take a minute and imagine what it would be like to have a six figure score and really feel that, you know, how, how would your life change if you had a six figure score and how would your life change if not only did you get a six figure score, but you also had the confidence that you could repeat that result whenever you entered a live tournament to know that every tournament that you entered was a profitable investment and that you were a favorite in the field to not only cash, but to win. What would life be like if you had that skill set and you were the most confident player on the poker table? You know, how would you feel about buying into your local main event or the World Series of Poker main event? How would you feel about not having to play satellites anymore and to be able to buy in direct? or even be able to sell pieces if that's what you need because other people believed in your ability to take down that event. Just kind of connect with that feeling and carry that with you because that is what tonight's presentation is all about. So the three big mistakes and why you need to know. Uh, the reason you need to know about these three mistakes is that these mistakes are costing you chips probably without you even realizing it. There's a lot of kind of almost invisible ways to lose money and lose expected value when playing poker um, that only when someone else points them out do you become aware and be like, oh, I totally do that. I didn't realize, you know, I was losing money there, losing chips there, and just how significant those losses were. Um, I know I didn't realize there was a lot of places that I was passing up on expected value and missing out on opportunities to gain chips until my mentors pointed it out and said, hey, if you want to get results, you got to change these things. You know, because I came from a background of sit and goes and cash games where it was all about, you know, being patient, selecting your spots. But in tournaments where there are antis and, you know, you're playing for those top three spots, you got to get more involved in the action and it requires a different style of play. And these situations that we're going to talk about happen extremely frequently. So despite the fact that they may seem like minor details, they may seem like very small amounts of chips being passed up on here and there, because these situations happen extremely frequently, it makes them actually major issues to not be aware of them and to not be addressing them. And another reason you need to know about these three big mistakes is that when you get these three right, it's, you know, it's about 70% of the battle. Um, these links are, these leaks are slowly, but surely sinking your battleship over and over and over. And they're the reason that, you know, you're having trouble running deep into the money. You're having trouble building a big stack. You're having trouble being, you know, the top stack going on the final table. It's because of these three things. And when you get these th three things, right, everything else will fall into place. Um, I learned in a book. Uh, while I was, you know, just studying every single thing I could on poker tournaments, reading voraciously every piece of content, um, that much of successful tournament play is winning small pots. It's about stealing effectively. It's about re-stealing well. And Gus Hansen's book, Every Hand Revealed, really pointed out that winning a tournament has a lot to do with just not bleeding chips and picking up the chips that other people aren't protecting. A lot of the big pots play themselves, but when you're winning all the small pots, you can withstand the variance of getting unlucky in a couple of big pots. Um, so a quick thanks to Gus for the insights here. And now I'm going to show you what I learned from this book and my mentors and my, 
what is it now, six years of experience firsthand playing poker tournaments. So let's get started. The three big mistakes most players make in small tournaments begin with number one, uh, playing too loose, especially from early position. Now, this topic we're going to cover over the next few slides, but also I go in super in depth in this in my six hour class, my WSOP winning formula. This is a breakdown of the system I use to cash the World Series of Poker main event four years in a row, starting with that run in 2012. Uh, I talk about what hands to play from what position. I also talk about when to play wider ranges and tighter ranges from those baseline ranges. And I also talk about how to pick up tells on your opponents, which will allow you to adjust your ranges hugely to make the most of profitable spots and get to play way more hands and also to avoid trouble when it's very clear that someone else has been dealt a premium hand. And, um, you know, when you're playing hands that are on the edge and mainly get their profit from stealing the blinds and everyone else folding, well, in those situations, they become easy folds when you have a tell on your opponents. So more on that in that program. Now, why it's a big deal to play too loose, especially from early position. The first thing is the positional disadvantage. Um, now we're talking about playing out of position post-flop as opposed to in position uh, pre-flop. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, the positional disadvantage and how much worse it is to be playing out of position post-flop as opposed to in position post-flop, um, that's okay. Just write this down in your notes to search grips to triple threat on YouTube and you'll find a 45 minute video completely free that has some great graphics on the basics, on you know what early position, middle position, late position, out of position is, and also talks about the two types of position, relative position and absolute position. So that's a great supplement if it's your first time hearing about the positional disadvantage and that's some extra study you can do on your own time. Um, now the second reason that playing too loose is a big deal is uh, something to do with negative expected value. Okay, so poker is all about making plus EV or positive expected value investments. That's how we win in the long game. We make a lot of positive expected value investments. Now, when making plays with a negative expected value, you're asking to go broke. You know, it may take a while, but little by little, every hand you play that shows a negative expected value or every line you take post flop that shows a negative expected value, you're putting yourself in a losing trajectory and slowly bleeding chips. Whereas when you're only making plays with positive expected value and only playing hands that show a positive expected value from the positions you open them, you are slowly gaining chips over the long run. Now, I really want to make something clear because I've tried being a nit and I've tried being a maniac and I always thought, you know, the maniacs had more fun and it was cooler to be maniacal and put people to the test and apply a lot of pressure and it just seemed more exciting. Um, but what I realized is when I came back to just playing solid ranges from all positions, not only did I get more chips, I experienced less stress and therefore had more energy because I wasn't out there fighting uphill battles. So the truth is it's easy to play pre-flop well. It's not hard to play pre-flop well. You just need to keep it simple and, and just be patient. And you wanna play profitable hands in the proper positions. And when you start with that as your baseline, you start with a plus EV, a positive expected value, and you start with an advantage on every betting round of the game, and that's how you win. When you have a positive expected value, your opponent has a negative expected value, you own more than your fair share of the pie. And with a positional advantage, that, 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 uh, that edge, that slice of the pie is only bigger. And you just apply that over and over and over again. Okay, so talking a little bit more about positional disadvantage and the dangers of playing out of position. So remember, every time you act before your opponent, you are at a disadvantage. This is because poker is a game of imperfect information and in the land of the blind, the man with one eye is king. When you're out of position, you're basically playing blind. When you're in position, you got to see one more action. You're the man with one eye. You're king. You have, you, you have an advantage over your opponent. Every time you act after your opponent, you're at an advantage in this game. And if you had the choice between being at a disadvantage or an advantage, which one would you pick? Right? Advantage. 
And, and, and this applies every single street. So it's not just, you know, on the flop you get the advantage. It's the flop, turn, and river you have the advantage. And what do we know about pot growth from my uh, webinar on position? Is that every street we play, the pot gets bigger. And that means that having that one extra piece of information, that one line of sight, that one eye is worth more and more every street because the stakes are bigger. So the higher the stakes, the more this advantage or disadvantage is magnified. And when you're playing out of position, you're basically fighting an uphill battle. Sure, you know, if you're super strong, you may be able to win that battle, you know, i.e. having a really good hand, but it's going to be a lot harder when you're fighting uphill. So, you know, this is you trying to play out of position, fighting that uphill battle, and it wouldn't be that much easier if you were playing in position and you were pushing this boulder downhill. Um, that's just why it's so much easier to win chips playing in position. Now, how big is that boulder? That depends how deep the stacks are. But basically, when you're playing deep stacked out of position, you are pushing a huge boulder up a hill, and it is a very difficult task to overcome. Play your pots in position, and the bigger the stacks are when you're playing in position, the faster that rock is going to be rolling downhill, and you're going to be the one benefiting from that snowball effect. So let's look at some, some expected value to, to illustrate this. We've talked about the positional advantage and disadvantage, and now we're going to talk about positive versus negative expected value. So here are some equity charts. This is pulled from Poker Stove. The program is, no, this is pulled from Equilab, the newer version of Poker Stove. And it's completely free. If you just Google Equilab, you will find the program. You can download it. I think it's fantastic. And what I did here was I took the equities of Ace-King on the bottom versus a 50% hand range, which is the row above it, a 15% hand range, two rows above it, and a 10% range, which is on the top. And the reason I chose these ranges is because when you open under the gun on a 9 or 10-handed table, odds are with, you know, nine ants to get through, eight ants to get through, someone's going to have a top 10% hand most of the time. When you open from mid position, later position, you're going to run into a top 15 to 20% hand most of the time. That's what happens when there are five to six people who still have hands. Odds are one of them's in that top 15 to 20th percentile. And the top 50, the reason I put that is because that's what a lot of players will defend from the blinds. A lot of players will defend 30 to 50% of the blind. So you'll often be up against this range. And it's important to see that when the flop comes down, and you know, we have that pie, which is the pot, how much of that pie or pot belongs to you? And that's what your equity is. So if you have ace king and you're up against a 50% range, you own almost two thirds of that pie. If you play that hand over and over and over, you probably win about two thirds of that pie. Uh, if you're playing against a 15% range, you own about 60% of that pie. And even against a top 10% range, you still own 60% of that pie. That's a significant advantage. That's what 20% advantage difference between the two. Um, you know, looking at another premium hand like pocket nines against that 50% range, you're an even bigger favorite, 65%. Against the top 15% range, not quite as strong as ace king, but pretty big, 58%. And against the top 10% range, which, as you can see, is a pretty strong range. You can see the actual hands there um, in the top row there, the ones that were selected. Um, you're looking at 54% equity. Um, so are you a favorite? Do you own more than half the pot? Fantastic. You're already starting at an advantage. And when you're playing strong hands you're going to win more than 50% of the pot on average. So that means for every dollar you put in and your opponent puts a dollar in, you're going to get more than a dollar back. And that is a winning proposition. Now, as we move later in position, we don't need hands quite as strong as ace king and pocket nines, as I'll show you on later slides, but we do need hands that are a favorite to justify playing them. Um, and again, the tool I used is Equilab. I think it's really great. Write it down, download it later. Uh, Thank me later. So next up, let's look at some marginal, mediocre hands, which, uh, you know, as I, when I was experimenting with loose play, I was opening these hands every time I was dealt them because, you know, I thought I had to play looser. There are antis in there. I need to get involved in the action more. But I found myself just 
bleeding chips and having trouble playing out of position. And when I ran the numbers, I realized why. You know, ace two suited against a 50% range, yeah, it's a favorite, but a pretty slight favorite, 51%. As soon as you're up against that top 15 or top 10% range, which is what you're gonna get cold called by when someone calls you in position, you're already starting the hand at a disadvantage. For every dollar you put in, you're only getting 90 cents back if they call with the top 15%. They call with top 10%, for every dollar you put in, you're only getting 80 cents back. That's not a good long run proposition, is it? Another marginal hand that a lot of people play from early position because they're like, oh, I got dealt a pair. I'm supposed to play a pair. A pair is a good hand. Well, again, looking at equities, a small pair is not that great of a hand. Against a 50% range, you're a slight favorite at 52. Uh, but as soon as you get into those top 15, top 10% ranges, even though top 15% has all the pairs, you're still an underdog because rarely is fourth pair, fifth pair on the river relative to the board going to be the winner once all the cards are dealt. Um, so these are hands that you see, we don't really want to open from early or even mid position in a lot of cases because they're a slight underdog against those stronger hands. Once you get into the cutoff and the button where you only have, you know, you're only likely to get up against the top 25 or 33% of hands, you can justify playing these hands because you're going to have an equity advantage you're also very likely to be in position for the rest of the hand. But otherwise, uh, and that, without that being the case, when you're in an earlier position, you just wanna fold these hands because they're gonna be showing a negative expectation. Um, the same goes for hands like Jack-10 offsuit and Broadway hands that can make top pair very often, but they're only a favorite against a wide range like that 30%, 50% range. They're not a favorite against those tighter ranges, 10 to 15%. And um, the key is, we have this equity, hand versus hand, but to actually realize the equity, we have to get to showdown, and getting a showdown is another story. So marginal hands win 50% of the pot on average if we get to the showdown, and it's much easier to realize equity and get to showdown when we are playing in position as opposed to out of position, because you know? we can check back flops or we can, you know, see bet small on the flop, check back the turn, get to the river. We have all these plays, like the free card play, that we can do in position that we can't do out of position. And that's just another reason why playing as many pots as possible in position is critical to your success in poker tournaments and poker in general. Um, now, negative expected value, really getting into it. Um, I just took one example here because, you know, all favorite hands are this. So for this example, I took 7-5 suited. You know, it's one of those pretty hands. can make some straights can make some flushes, it's very sneaky, it's very disguised. And, you know, those fun hands, well, they're just losing hands. Even against a 50% range, 7-5 suit is an underdog. It only has 40% equity. And once you get into those stronger ranges, 15, 10%, it has less than 40, 37, 34%. This is a losing hand. You're losing a ton of money when you play this hand um, in heads-up situations, especially in early position, especially out of position. Um, in general, these hands should be avoided. Um, now, most favorite hands, your 7-5 suited, your 6-3 suited, your queen 7 suited, I don't know, whatever your favorite hand is, if it's not aces, those favorite hands win less than 50% of the pot on average, and it's usually way less than 50%. Um, so you may have the question, well, why even open 7-5 suited on the button if it's a losing hand against top 50% range? Well, that's because in position, we have a lot of other things going for us. We have that ability to control the pot size and manipulate it to get paid off. This hand has low equity, but it has high potential for making a strong hand by the river. And that's a hand that can extract a lot of value against a wide range. Now, if we're talking speculative hand versus speculative hand, the hand that's going to win all the chips versus 7-5 suited is ace-2 suited because in a flush over flush situation, the suited ace gets all of it. Or ace seven suited versus seven five suited is gonna get all the money when it comes seven seven X. So the thought that these hands, you know, will make trips and stuff. Well, we need to ask, cool, they'll make trips, but will I get paid when I hit trips? And what hands am I getting paid by? So this is why we need to be really cautious with these hands, especially out of position, because it's just not a winning proposition to play these hands. And you're setting yourself up for failure by opening these hands into the field, into the rest of the table. 
Uh, the main takeaway from this is that big cards make big hands, and those are the cards that are going to help you build your chip stack. And if you just respect the opening ranges suggested by myself and by Jonathan Little for what hands to open by position, you don't, you don't throw in these sneaky hands and these favorite hands. You're going to do way better in the long run um, than you will if you're unable to overcome temptation. Now, comes to playing too loose i know there are some typical justifications like well number one you know i'm just going to outplay my opponents um, they have a hard time reading me or number two i'm going to get paid off on my sneaky hand when i hit it right fair fair statements you've probably heard these around your card room before you may have even heard these words uttered from your own mouth i, I said them before when i didn't know as much about the game as i do now and so my response to that is oh really um when it comes to question number one, well, how are you going to outplay your opponents when you have worse position and less information and you also have the worst hand and less equity? It's a major handicap to overcome. If you can tell me how you can overcome those two things, which are like two of the three main factors in poker, then kudos to you and please teach me how to improve my game. Um, as for the second one, I'll get paid off when I hit my sneaky hands. Well, how exactly? You know, first, to get paid off, you need a strong hand. You need, you need your opponent to have a strong hand that, you know, will give you the implied odds. And that would probably mean they're going to three bet, which means you now have to call a three bet out of position. Also, to build the pot when you hit your hand you want position. You want to have control over the pot size. You can't be playing out of position where they have control over the pot size. And these days, people can read the boards well. They can read hands well. They know when draws come in and they know when to slow down. So the truth of the matter is, usually you, you just don't have the implied odds that you might hope you have with a hand like that. In fact, you actually have a reverse implied odds. Um, and so it's really important to recognize, am I wanting to play this hand because it's profitable? Or am I wanting to play this hand because I'm bored and I'm looking for action? And if you're coming from the mind of I'm bored and looking for action, you're gambling. And if you're coming from the mindset, I want to play it because it's a profitable hand, you're investing. And it's investors that make money in this game and gamblers who fund the investors in their poker pursuits. So I really hope that you're more on the side of being an investor than a gambler because it's, it's just better. It may not be as exciting in the moment, but it's a lot more satisfying and fulfilling in the long run. I promise you. Let's keep going. Um, the three big mistakes most players make in small stakes tournaments. Mistake number one, playing too loose, especially from early position. And number two, not defending their blinds properly and effectively. Um, yeah, this is, this is a big one because it's going to spin things a little bit on their head. We just talked about not playing too wide. And I'm going to talk to you about how you can play wider, but only from this very specific position of the big blind. And the reason why is because of odds. So how to defend your blinds, two methods. The first way to defend your blind is defensively, which is just calling. That's taking your price, taking your pot odds, closing the action, seeing three cards, seeing if you improve. Great. Um, the second way is aggressively, which is three betting. And, you know, there's the third option, of course, of folding, but that's not defending. That's surrendering. It's like, you know, in blackjack, when you get dealt, I don't know, like a six and the dealer's showing an ace, you might want to surrender there. Which So it's, it's okay with trash when you have a really bad hand in the big blind. Uh, it's totally fine to fold. It's totally fine to surrender. But given the odds you're getting in the big blind, most hands are playable. Most hands are justifiable. Now, for both the defensive and aggressive defense, notice that I have a star on them, and that's because you got to make sure you follow the scientific method when you are defending your blind. You can't just defend your blind because you feel like it, because you have a game plan. You want to follow the scientific method because the scientific method is where the profitability comes from in this game. Um, if you don't follow the scientific method, you are very likely going to end up like this guy. So take a moment with me and, and reflect on, you know, how often have you lost a huge pot from the blinds with a hand like top pair bad kicker or, you know, middle pair 
blind versus blind. You know, like even worse than, than from the blinds, like blind versus blind with something like middle pair. How often have you grossly overplayed a hand from that position? Small blind or big blind out of position? At least once or twice, right? I, I've done it at least once or twice. Now, when it comes to defending the blinds, most players do one or the other. They either don't defend their blind out enough and they miss out on their odds, or they over defend. So they'll defend every hand that's dealt to them because they think they're getting a great price. But then post flop, they overplay their hand. They continue defending really loosely post flop when they're supposed to tighten up. And that's how they end up in this position of WTF did I just do? And when they do that, they undo the value. You know, they got that great proposition pre flop, but then they made a bunch of errors post flop that way outdid the value that they got pre flop and they just played incorrectly. So fortunately, I'm going to teach you how to play correctly from the blinds um, using some software. Scientific method, defending your big blind. So first, we got to look at some math. Poker's a math game. It's very important to know your numbers in this game. And just maybe you want to save this chart and the chart that's going to come after. Maybe you want to write it down, print screen, whatever works for you. But when you are in the big blind facing a raise size of 2x, a min raise, you get a 3.5 to 1 odds, which means you need about 22% equity to break even on your call. Not 50%, 22%. That means you can call out of the big blind, lose the pot three times out of four, and you're still making money. If you're facing two and a half times raise, you're getting one, four to one and a half, 27% uh, equity required. And facing even a three X raise, getting four and a half to two, or what would that be? 2.25 to one. You need 31% equity. So again, you could defend your big blind to a three X raise, lose the pot two times out of three, and you're still finding an edge there. 31%, 33% when you needed 31. Now, when the ante's come into play, the odds only get better. Now, facing a 2x raise, you're getting four and a half to one. You only need 18% equity to win. You only need to win that pot 18% of the time to be profitable. Uh, facing a two and a half x raise, again, one and a, one and a half to five, 23% equity required. And facing a three x raise, two to five and a half. You only need 27% equity to show a profit. So again, even facing these slightly bigger raises, if antes are in play, you can lose the pot three times out of four and still show a profit. Um, so very important, these numbers, because that's it's just showing you that it's okay to see the flop and fold most of the time, even though from a psychological perspective, to lose more than half the time seems like it's a mistake. So I'm putting in money and I'm, and I'm not getting it back half the time. That feels like I'm losing more often than I should. But because those odds are there, this is the difficulty of being a human being sometimes. We don't understand numbers that well. Um, it's just, just the way we're wired. Um, we miss out on the fact that, oh, we were getting odds, so it's actually good play, even though from an emotional perspective, losing more often than winning, percentage-wise, feels like a loss. So you're losing two out of three or three out of four, so emotionally it feels like you're losing, but mathematically, intellectually, you're actually winning. This is a crucial concept to get, not just for defending the blinds, but also for calling correctly on rivers. Um, so yeah, we got the numbers, but so what, right? How does that help you help save you from donking it off, spewing it away when you hit top pair with no kicker on the flop, right? Great question. Great question. So we've got the scientific method. This is how to, how to F it up. We don't want to be doing that. So this is um, Ed Miller's pyramids from Poker's 1% where he discusses how to think and play like the one percentile or the 99th percentile in poker who make pretty much all the money. You got 10% are winning players total and then 10% and 10% make all the money and that's poker's 1%. And what they're doing is they're following a defensive strategy where they defend the range pre-flop and then when they face a bet on the flop, they fold some hands. So they're now defending a smaller range on the flop, facing other bets, smaller range on the turn, facing bets, smaller range on the river. And they get fewer and fewer hands as they have to invest more and more money. That's the strategy. And, and based on the bet sizing they're facing, you'd either fold more hands facing a big bet or fold fewer hands facing a small bet. Um, and you always want to continue with the best hands that you have. Uh, as for what they are, we're going to look at that on the very next slide. 
Um, now, from the blinds, it's a different situation because pre-flop, you were getting that really good price so you can defend many more hands than you could regularly. You're getting better odds, but once the flop comes down, you're allowed to throw away a ton of those hands. And a lot of people's mistake who over-defend the blind is that they take this wider base of defending pre-flop on the right side, but then they follow the pyramidal structure from the left. And then they're just too wide the whole way. So they have too many hands on the flop, they're defending too many hands on the turn, they're defending too many hands on the river, they're defending, and they're continuing with a lot of unprofitable hands. But when you're following the scientific method, you defend wider pre-flop because you're getting really good odds out of the big blind, but then you play very solid on the flop because now the stakes are bigger, now you're playing multiple streets out of position, and you want to have a good hand in that situation. So to reiterate, in the blinds, you get a great price, so you can continue with a ton of hands, but only because you got great odds. And so you don't need to do the same on the flop where you're no longer getting amazing odds when facing a pot size bet, for example. And yeah, where most people get it wrong is they continue to over defend post flop when that's when it's time to tighten up, uh, especially out of position. If you don't hit a great, and I mean great board, you can just fold. It's not only fine, it's correct. So scientific method, how to do it right. We know how to F it up. Now we want to look at how to do it right. So on the left here, this is, uh, this is from Flopzilla, this program here. Uh, I'm a big fan of this. Alex Fitzgerald's a big fan of this. He's the one who got me onto it. It's, it's an awesome program. I think it's like $35. And with this program, you can list the percentages of hands that you want to look at, range. You can run it on different boards and see how they hit. And you can also put other hands in on the right side, which I cut off for this picture. Um, that shows how a hand is doing against a range, how often the hand is best on the flop, the range is best on the flop, and how often the hand or range will be best by the river. Super powerful tool, super awesome study, cannot more highly recommend it. Um, it's great. So let's look at some flops. On the left, I have a 50% approximately defending range, which is what uh, a lot of the sharp players are going to be playing from the blind. So they're going to have all pairs, uh, almost all aces, except for maybe ace two. Um, all suited hands because of their ability to make flushes, which are hands that can, um, you know, they're robust, they can do well in big pots. And then the connectors, the broadways, maybe reaching down to the nines, and then the true connectors that can make straights. And on the right side, you'll see all these things like quads, full house, flush, straight, three of a kind, two pair, over pair, top pair, flush draw, two card, OBSD, uh, flush draw pair, gut shot, all that. So the purple section at the bottom is the combo draws. The green section is the regular draws. And then the blue section is the made hands or pairs. At the very bottom where it says major key, you can see how often the range is hit. And what I did, the range, that number is based on what boxes you check. So you can see I've checked top pair and better. I've checked the strong draws, flush draws and open enders. And I've checked the combo draws. And that brings us to about 29.4% with a 50% range. If you're playing a tighter range, this number is going to be way higher. The, the, the hand's going to hit a strong hand way more often. If you play a wider range, it'll be less so. Um, now, you remember, uh, remember these guys? The equity we need to continue, 22%, 27 31%. And the with ante, 18 23 27%. Perfect. Well, if we look at the range here, it's hit 29% of the time. That's pretty much meeting our minimum defense frequency for even facing a 3x raise uh, without ante. We're almost there for without ante. We'd add maybe a couple of pocket pairs below top pair. Uh, but you can see that we're going to be able to defend 30% of the time, and we're only calling with top pair and better and are really strong draws. You do not need to continue with your second pairs and your bottom pairs and your gut shots and all those junk hands post-flop when you defend it from your big blind. You can call with a reasonably wide range because you're getting good odds and look for really good flops where you have top pair or better or a strong eight to nine out draw or better. You can fold everything else and you're playing correctly. Um, and this is with almost a 50% range. Top pair is 30% plus. You do this with a 30% range or a 25% range, you're going to see that the range is hit way harder and you don't have to reach down to defend those middle and weak pairs. It's only when you defend with a weak hand that you have to add those hands in to be defending correctly. So 
let's look at a few examples, shall we? Because this is a range perspective, um, but I want to show you exactly what individual hands look like. Um, so first, you know, we have seven, five suited, um, doing the same selections, top pair and better flush draws and open enders and combo draws. You see it's hit 26.8% of the time. So it's about 3% lower than the top 50% because seven, five suited just isn't in that top of range. And so facing a two and a half X with no ante or a three X with ante, you could defend just your best hands and you're doing fine. But if you're calling a three X, no ante, or, you know, you're calling a three and a half X raise, you may need to start defending with some middle pairs as well. Just add some of those in there or some of your gut shots to justify defending with a hand like seven, five suited. Um, but again, that's the beautiful thing about this program is you can see exactly what the numbers are and make sure you're hitting that defense frequency. And you'll see that, Oh, I don't need to go crazy with my defenses because I'm defending more than enough. You know, if someone's min raising, you could, you could only defend even half your straight draws or half your flush draws and your top pair embedding. You're still defending enough. So that's, that's where the math is really powerful. Um, now let's take a hand like Jack 10 offsuit, which, um, you know, won't make as many flush draws. In fact, it won't make any flush draws as, at all, but it's going to make top pair a lot more often. So in this case, Again, just playing top pair and better in the open end straight draws and combo draws already 31.7%. You're meeting your minimum defense frequency, um, even facing a 3x raise pre-flop by just defending top pair and better on the flop. It's amazing, right? And that's because Broadway hands make top pair very often. That's what makes King Queen such an awesome defend as opposed to a hand like 8-7. Um, you know, 8-7 is going to have to defend some middle pairs to be able to justify continuing. But if you just defend Broadway's, you can continue with top hair plus and you're doing fine. Um, so, you know, you don't need to defend your Jack five off suits and King three off and junk like that. All right, let's look at, yeah. Um, ace two off suit. Now this is an interesting one because a lot of people think, well, I have an ace. I'm supposed to defend an ace and ace is a good hand. Um, but when you look at how often the range is hit here, top pair better. 19.6% of the time. That's low. That's dust. It's because ace two off cannot flop open end straight draws. It's only got one way to make a straight. That's the wheel. It cannot flop flush draws because it's not suited. And it only flops top pair with the ace. And even then it's troublesome. The rest of the time it flops bottom pair and never flops middle pair. So ace two off is just a trouble hand. And that's why when you're defending, you're constructing your defending range, you want to play suited aces and, and, and straight drawing hands and Broadway hands and hands that potential because they have playability. Ace two offsuit lacks playability and so it's very hard to defend enough post-flop, whereas connectors, suited hands, pairs, high cards, things like that have a ton of playability. But then like ace two offsuit, you gotta ask where are you gonna find your 30%? We're at 19.6 top pair. We gotta to reach to play some weak pairs in there to be defending off for some gut shots. We don't want to have to be doing that. And this is why you can fold the trash of your hands when facing a raise, but you probably want to call raises in heads up situations with pretty much all your suited hands and most of your connected hands and all your high card hands. Um, if you prioritize pairs, high hands, connectors and suited hands in your defending range, you will have an easy time defending enough and you do not have to put yourself in troublesome situations. You just have to remember that it's okay to fold on the flop when you don't hit it hard, even though you invested pre-flop. Um, and, and in terms of building your defending range out because you don't wanna to go too extreme too fast, you don't need to defend super wide right away, but I just want to make you aware of how wide you can defend and why mathematically it's not only fine, but it's correct. And also that it's only correct if you are playing post-flop correctly. If you're playing incorrectly post-flop, you're better off not defending wide because you're going to keep yourself out of trouble. Hope that makes sense. I found that it didn't make sense until I saw it kind of displayed in front of me with some software, and then it made complete sense when all the information was right there on the screen. So let's talk a little bit about not defending the blinds enough. The typical fears and the typical reasons why people don't defend their blinds enough. Um, the first one is, what if I flop a marginal hand? Well, if you flop a marginal hand, as you just saw in the previous slide, you check and fold it. No shame in that and no profit lost in that. Number two is, well, what if I'm short stacked? And if you're short stacked, then 
You're gonna to wanna to play more aggressively with your high equity hands, like top pairs, draws, and gut shots and overs. And what I mean by play more aggressively is play them faster to try to get the money in. Because winning a pot when your opponent bet folds and you're very short stack is a huge chip up for you. And when you can increase your stack 20 to 30 to 50% without a showdown, that is one of the biggest gains that you can get in this game. And I have a whole section on that in my MTT video guide because it's just, this game is all about winning pots without showdown when you can. Cards are just there to break the ties when you're unable to get the job done with your chips. Now, number three, the question is, well, what if I get it in behind? And if that, if you get in behind, then be prepared to double up 30 to 45% of the time to an actual playable stack. It's pretty rare a hand has less than 30% equity against a range. You can see that in Equilab. You can see that in Flopzilla. You know, I mean, versus aces and kings only, some hands have 20%. But what opponent do you know that only plays aces and kings but doesn't play ace king as well? So I think when you get it in behind, you should be proud. You should be excited because... I, I, I see people do this and I've been this guy, you know, I'm holding on to my tournament life. I thought like Phil Hellmuth, I, I want to be able to say, I always get it in with the best hand. When I get it in, I have the best of it because, you know, I wanted to satisfy my ego to show myself that I was a good player and I was a smart player and I was a responsible player. But here's the thing. And I got this one from Phil Ivey, who's, who's got some pretty good results. And that's, if you're never getting it in bad, you're not getting it in enough. And you're missing out on winning a ton of pots without showdown which is where it's all, where it's at. Um, so what I see a lot with tournaments is people kind of acting like their tournament life, they're holding on to it, but really when they're playing this fashion, their tournament life is on a downward trend and it's a matter of time before they kind of whittle away and, and die off anyway. But if you're playing in this other fashion, you're moving the other direction. If you get it in behind and you double up, well, suddenly you're at this peak at the top where now you're just cruising and you can use all the weapons at your disposal to pick up chips from the other people who are holding on to their tournament life for dear life, not realizing that it ain't worth a whole lot. And so I find what the real question is for a lot of people who are afraid to make plays like this, what they're really saying is, well, what do I do if I get a big stack? They don't know what to do if they get a big stack because it's more decisions. There's more room for error. There's also more room for making your opponents make errors. And that's where studying the game and just learning how to use all the different tactics makes all the difference. So if, if you have concern number four, then get comfortable playing big stack poker and making some big boy decisions and big girl decisions too. Because if you aren't comfortable with making those decisions and playing those deep stack pots and handling the pressure, how do you ever expect to win a tournament? Not cash, not squeak to the final table, but win because that's where all the money is. You got to want to have a big stack. You got to do what it takes to get a big stack and be ready and willing to use a big stack properly when you get your hands on it. And I go super deep into that in my MTT video guide where I dive into both the five short stack weapons to help you get a big stack and the five big stack weapons to turn that big stack into a top three finishing stack where you get paid. Now, scientific method, we've looked at passive defending for the big blind. Now we're going to look at aggressive defending for the big blind. Three betting your big blind. This is the magic formula that is going to make you all the money in poker tournaments. Okay, get it ready. You got your pen. You ready to write it down? I hope so. Your expected value is X times pot size plus one minus X times stack size times two plus dead money times equity when called. Can you see what's going on here? Do you have a guess at what X is? Hint. X is your opponent's folding frequency because when you go all in and your opponent folds, you win what's in the pot. Whereas when you go all in and your opponent calls you, which is the opposite of the times they fold, well, now you double up your stack because you get your stack plus their stack plus the dead money in the pot. And the frequency at which that happened is your equity when called. So maybe you have 30%, maybe you have 40%, maybe you have 50%, but you're going to have a percent and it's not going to be like 20 because you're probably not going to be doing this with seven deuce offsuit. But the most important variable here is the X, the fold frequency, because it's very significant. Now, this X can unlock a huge amount of profit for you. And the only time X doesn't exist is when your opponent is calling with 100% of the hands they open. And that's just very rare. 
Um, that only happens when either you have no fold equity because you know they make it three blinds and you have five blinds, so they're gonna they're gonna call you, um, or if someone's just super tight and opening from early position. That's why this play, this this reshub, shouldn't be done from early position versus early position very often because those players have tight ranges. You want to make this play against players who have wide-ish raises ranges. Okay, so got the formula, write it down, good because we're gonna do some work. And teach you how to three bet and uh i hope you got that formula because i've got a calculator for you okay and this is to really demonstrate something here that this is just it, it blew my mind when i finally understood it when i finally clicked it because in cash games you know i was trying to make hands and get paid and, and trying to win money with my cards make a hand and then get paid in full but in tournaments because stacks are shallower because big hands are made less frequently because you don't have as much time and the antis are bigger and things happen faster. The main thing that's gonna win you a tournament is not your cards, it's your chips. To succeed in tournaments, you have got to believe that the main thing that's gonna win you a tournament is your chips, not your cards, okay? So looking at this uh, calculator here, this is ICMizer, another amazing program, the cost is eight to twenty dollars a month depending on the plan you choose i just go with the basic option it gives me everything i need and you can punch in stack size uh raise size person's opening range calling range and then run the numbers so in this situation we are 25 blinds deep uh, facing a 2.2x open from the button who is opening the top 30 percent of hands and he's calling with the top 15 percent. so he's calling half the time x is 50 percent and this is what we should be reshoving with. All pairs, ace nine offsuit, suited connectors down to 10 nine, ace eight suited, all suited broadways, king queen and ace five. Reasonable range. If you're not shoving these hands, you're missing out on some value. I assume that most of you are shoving these hands. Now, let's see what happens when X drops to uh, 67 instead of 50. So instead of calling with 15% of hands, he's calling with 10, meaning he's folding 20% of hands. Suddenly, our shoving range gets really wide, and it's still profitable. The green hands are profitable, the red hands are unprofitable, and the number below is exactly how many chips it's profitable for. So if someone's opening the button 2.2x with 30% hands and calling with 10% of them, you can profitably reshove any two cards above an eight, any pair, any suited queen, king, ace, almost any suited jack, and a very wide, generous range of suited gappers and two gappers, okay? Now, let's take it one step further and see what happens if they're only calling with the top 5% of hands. So X is now 83. You can profitably shove any two cards and even three deuce offsuit is showing more than a full big blind of profit. Why? Because X is so big in this situation and your chips are getting so much job done and it's working so often that the cards just don't matter. You're only getting into that right side of the equation 17% of the time. And even when you get there, you're going to win about a third of the time that you get there. So you can shove anything in this spot. And this is when we're dealing with an opener who plays 30% of hands. Imagine if someone is opening 50, 70, 100% of hands, which big stacks often do on bubbles. Imagine how much more profitable it's going to be to shove extremely wide on 25 blinds. And that's a lot of blinds to shove in. You know, 25 is on the high end of a reshove stack. Now let's switch it up to 15 big blinds, which is kind of the sweet spot for a reshove stack because of that huge reward, that 30% chip up I kind of hinted at earlier that we're going after, we're looking for. So in this spot, same situation, player opens 2.2x, 30% opening range, 16% uh, calling range. So he's defending half the time to his open. On 15 blinds, you can still shove any ace, any pair, any suited king, ace, pretty much any suited queen, jack, suited gappers, any two cards above an eight, you can shove super wide because the risk to reward ratio is so good. X is 50. Now let's switch it to a 10% defending range where X is 67. You can shove any two cards profitably. Profitably. Because you have that perfect reshove stack size, 15 blinds, and this player's just folding too much of the time after they open. And most players are going to be doing that. Some really sharp players 
if both players have a reshove stack, might only open 15% planning to call with all 15 of it, uh, known as the low raise fold gap, but that's just not going to happen that often. So recognize this is against a, yeah, I could do this with top 5%, but there's no point. You already see that you can shove with any two. Um, and it's against a pretty tight opener from late position. 30% from late position is pretty tight. You make it 50, 70 or more, you're just printing money printing money by making this play and you're getting the job done with your chips but I, I caution you to just do this freely because you got to recognize that everything that matters here is the opponent's range we're looking at a late position opener whereas an early position opener is another story an early position opener is going to have that top 10 15 20 percent range where they're going to be defending enough and that's why you shouldn't run this play against early position openers and tight players um, your opponent's ranges both their opening range and their continuing range, which you can play with on ICMIs, are everything. And the beautiful thing about ICMIs is you can tinker with the opening range, the defending range, and the raise size and the stack size to find exactly what the sweet spots are. And your mind's just going to be blown you're at all the profitable spots you're going to unlock through doing this kind of study. Um, yeah, I know that's what happened to me. So uh, let's get stacking. The three big mistakes... Uh, most players make in small stakes tournaments, mistake number one, playing too loose, especially from early position. Mistake number two, not defending their blinds properly and effectively. And mistake number three, misplaying the bubble. Um, after studying with Calvin Anderson and Tony Gregg in 2016, I came back and played a live tournament and I brought some, um, I brought some new things to the mix with some bubble play I'd learned from Calvin. And using a big stack to play loose and apply a lot of pressure on the bubble. And that got me into the money with an even bigger stack. Then I did the same when I had a big stack going into the final table bubble, and guess what happened? I won the tournament. Well, as I told you on the first slide, technically we chopped it when I had the chip lead, so I got the most money, but I ended up finishing third on paper, hence the 95 instead of the 162. But as far as I'm concerned, I won the tournament. I got the most money. And I never would have had this result if I played my usual style on the bubble because I was missing out on the most lucrative part of the tournament, which is the bubble. And I was failing to use my chips to pick up more chips when they were the most valuable, most powerful they would be the entire tournament on the bubble. Um, by the way, in this program, A Life Changing Square, I review every single hand from that WPT Niagara run I went on, and I go over my pregame, postgame, and break time routines as well, which were all essential elements to getting the result that I did, because it's not just how you play your cards on the table, it's how you play your cards and make your decisions off the table as well that leads to getting uh, big wins and life-changing scores. So how most people play the bubble, well, how most people misplay the bubble. First way most people misplay it is either playing to cash, which is folding everything, you know, just trying to squeeze every little penny and get every little dime they can uh, because they just want to get to the money. You know, that old saying, I'll I get to the money, I'll cash, and then I'll loosen up, then I'll play. Cool. You and everyone else. And, you know, I get it. We're all human. We want money. Money equates to survival. Money equates to getting a lot of things. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just know that when you're playing to get that little bit of money, you're often missing out on the opportunity to get the big money, the life-changing money that could completely reinvent your entire paradigm instead of keeping you maintaining the status quo that you're at. And know that when you're playing this strategy, it's very obvious and it's really easy for other people to exploit it. And what you're giving up is what's getting them big stacks and the big scores. The people who are playing just to cash all the time are never getting the win. And the people who are taking advantage of the people who are playing to cash are the people you see with the big stacks in the money, on the final table, getting the wins. Um, the other way that people misplay the bubble is mindless aggression, just playing to win right now. Uh, they're thinking that the bubble is the time to win the tournament, no matter what their stack size is. They see when the bubble approaches, it's time to go crazy. And the bubble is a great time to amp up the aggression when the right factors are in place. But it should still be done within reason, or else you can get really hurt, kind of like skydiving without a parachute. Um, and you know what they say about chip stacks in the hands of reckless players. The bigger they are, the harder they fall. And the bigger the feeling of regret is afterwards as well. Uh, if you've ever had a big stack in a tournament and lost it, you probably know what I'm talking about. It doesn't feel good and it can haunt you for a long time. But when you know you're playing correct and following the right factors, you don't have those feelings of self-doubt anymore. 
because you can run the numbers and ensure you made the right play. So let's talk about how professionals cash in on the bubble. That's what I learned from some of the greatest minds in the game. Um, pros consider the following four factors on the bubble to help them make the most plus EV play. And I want to invite you in your next tournament, be it online or live, to pay attention to all of these things. Okay, all of these things. Um, factor one, stack size and opponent's stack size. Every single opponent on your table, stack size matters. If you're big and they're small, amp it up. If you're small and they're big, chill it out. Number two, the closer how many players remaining until the bubble bursts. The closer you get to the bubble, the more you should dial it up or dial it down based on what you found in factor one. Um, factor three is the payout structure of the event. How much is a min cash versus a max cash really matters. What is the multiplier here? The smaller the gap between the two, the more important caching is. Think like you know a sit and go where first is only two to 2.5 times what second place gets paid. And... Um, versus uh, a, a big field tournament where first can be 100 times what second is. And the thing is, if you come from sit and goes like I did, you have the cashing mentality because it's important to cash the tournament and then I play to win. Correct. But in an MTT where first place pays way more, cashing doesn't matter. And that's why I sucked at multi-table tournaments at first because I had that min cash mentality that would get me in the money a lot of times. But slowly and steadily, I was losing my money on my buy-ins because I wasn't playing correct tournament strategy, which is going for it when you have the chips to do so. Uh, and factor number four is the total number of chips in play because the percentage of chips in play matters. Um, an example of this, uh, there was a time in the 2014 World Series of Poker where I had like five blinds on the bubble. I was under the gun one. We were hand for hand, uh, one away from the money. And... I, I knew we were in the money next hand. I'd literally make $18,000, two buy-ins, uh, if I just waited a hand. So I said, you know, I'll fold queens if I get queens. And I meant it. That's exactly what I got. I got, I got two queens. I'm like, wow, am I actually going to fold queens? If on five blinds? Like, what? I might not have any fold equity after this. And I'm like, yeah, but if I put this in and get called, even if I'm a 70% favorite, I'm going to make no money 30% of the time. And if I just fold it, I'm going to make 18000 100% of the time. And I thought, well, okay, well, you know, cashing with five bigs is important, but what about my chances of winning the tournament? And because even if I doubled, if I get the shove through, I have seven blinds. If I double up, I have 11 and a half blinds. But because there's still so many players left and I have such a small percentage of the chips in play, whether I have five blinds or 10 blinds, my odds of making it deeper in the payout structure and doubling my payout are very small, even if I double up here. So in this case, Caching is very important, and it was correct for me to fold pretty much everything because not caching 30% of the time when I'm guaranteed to cash if I just fold is a huge blunder, and so I folded. Um, another example is the most recent one cat Niagara where I finished two off the money because with 12 blinds on the button, I had queen-jack suited, and I decided that I wanted to play the hands. Queen-jack suits, good-looking hands, strong hand, favored against two random hands. Jammed, ran into ace-king, lost. Now, it's not that I ran ace king, it's not that I lost, but it's a question of if I get the shove through, I get from 12 blinds to 14 blinds, 14 and a half, how much do I increase my chance of winning the tournament? And also, do I want to gamble to try to double up to get 25 blinds at this point? No, I just want to get the shove through. Now, if I'm guaranteed to cash and I can just find another hand in the next orbit or two orbits anyway, why would I even play the hand in the first place? Afterwards, I'm like, oh, I could have min raised could have limped queen jack suited and i messaged ali and he said dude just fold fold get in the money and then play your hands because the amount of equity you gain by picking up those two and a half blinds is, is meaningless compared to the importance of cash when you're literally two players off the money and it's not for a huge percentage of the chips in play so sometimes it's not worth the risk and by looking at all these factors in order you'll be able to make your decisions correctly and now i know this is short and we don't have time to go into all of it because we're getting pretty close to our time here. Um, but I dive really deep into this in my MTT video guide, my live MTC winning formula and my World Series of Poker winning system because it's such a crucial time in the tournament. It's one of your best opportunities to make chips. Uh, also, one of my mentors, Mike Wasserman uh, and good friends, goes super deep into this topic in his program, Small Edges, Big Profit. And this, one of those small edges is just massively exploiting the bubble, be it the regular bubble and the final table bubble. So 
How you can cash in on the bubble uh, on the right is a picture of the bubble factor. This is a concept that was introduced by Lee Nelson and uh, Tyson Stribe in their Kill Phil series. And it just shows at the beginning, there's kind of no pressure. And as you get farther along, the pressure increases until the bubble bursts and then it decreases again. And then it rises again, going up to the final table and then decreases as everyone's making a lot of money. And basically what the bubble factor is, is kind of like a multiplier you want to put um, on a situation when facing a call to, to skew the odds to actually factor in the bubble factor. Basically, you need to play tighter on the bubble when someone can bust you. And to, to, to really make the most of the bubble, you got to believe all the little details matter. And it's worth paying attention to everything. That's what poker is all about, is getting all the information and using it to your advantage. When I'm in a live tournament, I'm looking at every table on the bubble. I'm counting every stack. Not because I want to know how many more players until I get paid. That's only if I'm a very short stack. I want to know how many players and how many more hands do I think I'm going to get where I can take advantage of this prime opportunity to make chips and online. It's easier because you have the lobby. Um, and without this in, but without this info, you can't play perfectly on the bubble. And the closer you get to playing perfect, the closer you'll get to making profit. And that's what, that's what I want for you is just to make more money every time you play poker. Okay. So when we're looking at the bubble, you got to look at it differently as a big stack, a middle stack and a short stack. All the situations are very unique. So as a big stack, because you have the highest bubble factor uh, against the other stacks, the middle stack has the highest bubble factor against you because you can bust them. And the short stack can also be busted by you. So when you can bust people that are experienced, higher bubble factor. As a big stack, you want to go after the middle stack. You want to go after the short stack because they're experiencing this high bubble factor and therefore they need even higher equity and odds to continue against you. Likewise, as a middle stack, you want to go after the short stack because they have a high bubble factor against you. But the middle stack, the big stack does not have a high bubble factor against you because you can't bust him. He can bust you. And so you want to stay away from him or her. Now, as a short stack, the ironic thing is you want to go after the big stack because when the big stack is attacking you to use leverage the bubble factor, he's going to be playing a really wide range. And therefore, you can get a lot of folds from him um, using the magic formula that I showed you earlier. Now, key thing about the bubble factor is it really comes into play when you are calling the last bet and showing down the cards, whether it's pre-flop or post-flop. Whereas if you can be the shover pre-flop or the reshover pre-flop and you're going to get folds a lot of the time, the bubble factor is not in play. So, you know, when you, you get on, the, on the, the bubble and you know these big stacks are opening 50, 70, 100% of hands, this is the short stack. It's your opportunity to play back at them and take advantage of your fold equity. Um, now as a micro stack where you have no fold equity and you know, you're going to get called. If you're close to the money, you should just fold and take your payout. Your chance of laddering up is very small. Your chance of busting if you play a hand is very high, but your chance of getting paid if you're just patient and cautious is, is very high. And you want to maximize that payout when you're a short stack. Whereas when you're a big stack, you want to maximize your chances of winning. Now, don't play to end up as a micro stack was something that uh, Dan Harrington warned in his book. But if some event happens that leads you being like micro stack, very short, it's okay to squeak in and fold your way to the money. And again, uh, in my MTT video guide, I go way deeper in this, spending you know five to 10 minutes on each stack size. And in small edges, big profit, Mike goes even deeper into it as well. Cause it's just, this is, this is your time to shine when you know what you're doing. Um, talked a little bit about the multiplier and, and payouts matter. Uh, on the left here, we have Ali Sirovich when he was playing a super high roller bowl London. And on the right, we have Greg Marson playing the main event. So in the super high roller bowl London, main cash was 1.1 million. Max cash was 2.6 million. And the buy-in was 300,000. So we got a max cash that's only two, two and a half times the min cash. And we have a min cash that is almost four times the buy-in. That's huge. And in a field like this, cashing is very important much more so important than going for the win. This is when you try to cash, you try to win. That's exactly what Ali did. Cash the tournament for 1.1 million. Ended up playing a sick cooler on the last hand where he turned a set and uh, Mr. Katz river to flush. Um, they were both committed at that point. Uh, and he ended up getting second place, but he got a huge payday. Uh, $800,000 profit, almost four buy-ins in one of the biggest buy-in tournaments in the world. Um, whereas in the main event, uh, 2012, where the main cash was 20,000, 
and the max cash was 8.5 million, playing for the win was more important than playing to cash. Playing for the win and taking chances to build a stack that could be applied on the bubble and get to use that bubble factor as a weapon against other players is more important than moving up the payout structure with folding. So in tournaments where min cash is only one and a half to 2x your buy-in, but the max cash is 100 or 1,000 times your buy-in, you should be using the bubble as a chance to accumulate chips to propel you deeper into the field. Um, and as Charlie Carroll says, because I was watching his stream last year, he said, when you have a big stack on a high buy-in bubble, you want to go absolutely mental on your opponents. You want to go mental on your opponents and just go insane because people want cash. And you've seen from Bubble Factor that it's correct if they're close to cash to play for the cash. And something to remember is that because of satellites, even if the bubble doesn't mean a lot to you, you're like, oh, it's 2x my money. Because of satellites, most bubbles feel like big bubbles to people because it may be 20x, 15x their initial investment because they got off a satellite. And it's your job as a professional to know who these players are and to take advantage of their perceived need to cash as a chance to build up your stack so that you can cruise through the money section of the tournament and propel yourself to the final table. All right. Congratulations to both the boys, by the way. It was really awesome watching both these events. Uh, Ali on Poker Go and Greg right there at the Rio. One of the best moments of my life. Sweating that. So much fun. And I hope one day in the future, I'm going to be sweating you doing the exact same thing. I'll be front and center. Oh, trust me. I'll be right there. All right, so to recap what we learned today so we can get stacking for days. The three big mistakes most players make in small stakes tournaments are mistake number one, playing too loose, especially from early position. Mistake number two, not defending their blinds properly and effectively. Mistake number three, misplaying the bubble. And because I'm a nice guy and I like to give and I love to teach and I love to share everything I can to give you the best chance of getting results because student successes are what I live for. I added a bonus one, mistake number four, which is failing to plan for the marathon at hand, which is effectively planning to fail. And I'd love to go deep into this topic like I did on the other ones, but I'm, I'm at my time. I'm already over time and I respect your time. So I won't take another hour of yours. Um, so I hope you enjoyed and took a lot from this information. I'd like to ask you a question now. Um, would it be okay with you if I told you about the program that I've put together, which gives a more comprehensive teaching of everything I introduced tonight, including the live MTT system? Please let me know in the chat box. Um, I know some of you are tight on time, but I promise this will only take five to 10 minutes max. And we've already had an incredible 75 minutes. So what's five to 10 minutes more? All right, we got some, sure, please do Evan. Yes, yes, of course, mate. Thank you, sure, sure, let us know. Yes, yes, if you're talking, I'm listening. Yep, yes, would love it, sure, of course, go for it, do it. Okay, cool, we're gonna do it. I'm gonna tell you guys about, ooh, the ultimate grips. MTT bundle. And also for all you guys and girls who are nice enough to stick around tonight, um, appreciate all of you. I'm also going to take questions afterwards. So I'm going to tell you about the program that I put together and I'll field your questions. So if you have questions from earlier, you know, you wrote them down, get them ready and I'll get to them in about five, 10 minutes and I'll happily stay on for, I'll stay on for as long as you guys want pretty much to answer your questions because I'm loving this. And, uh, yeah, love to keep going. Okay, so let me present the Ultimate Grips MTT Bundle um, in partnership with Jonathan Little and the great people at PokerCoaching.com. I created the Ultimate Grips Bundle, and the Ultimate Grips Bundle is a compilation of all my best training programs from over the years, and it is for anyone who wants to master the fundamentals of both cash game poker and tournament poker and eliminate the biggest mistakes that most players make by going deep, deep, deep onto all these topics. So let's take a look at what's inside this 20 plus hour 
training program known as the Ultimate Grips Bundle. First, we have the live MTT winning system. It's a four hour training program that I just released this summer in preparation for the World Series of Poker. Uh, one of my students used this program to ironically cash the online event. Uh, so I guess the training carries over to online as well. It's an inside look at the system I've developed for caching live main events. So consistently, these would be the main events at your local casino, events at the World Series of Poker, or even side events at all those circuit events and WPTs and whatnot. It's the exact same system I use to win multiple five-digit caches in live tournaments, including that $162,000 score at the WPT Falls View Poker Classic. It is the ultimate mindset program. Um, I have a ton of experience in mental game coaching, meditation, uh, holistic lifestyle coaching, yoga, therapy. Uh, I know mindset, it's my favorite topic, and I packed everything I had in this program. So it includes four webinars, the first of which is perfecting the pregame, the second one, which is peak performance poker. So once you are in state, you can maintain that state. And the third one is playing like a champion, which is really about going for that win getting that title, getting that trophy, getting that big payday, not just getting that main cash. I also have a bonus webinar, which is planning your World Series of Poker Trip so you can minimize your cost, minimize your time lost, and maximize your time at the tables and um, maximize your odds of winning. So Live MTT system is a $199 value. So the Ultimate Grips Bundle, total value, $199 and counting. Next up, we have my WSOP winning formula which is the program I made right after I cashed the main event for the fourth year in a row, uh, which was one shy of Ronnie Barda's record, the all-time record five in a row. Uh, it's a must-have for all live MTT players. It's how I cashed the main event four years in a row. It's got the art of adjusting to your table, which is very important because that's adjusting the terrain that you're battling on. It's a mental game masterclass where I've got even more information in there. Uh, this was fresh off reading Think and Grow Rich, so I packed a lot of that stuff in there too, really powerful stuff, and a peak performance program all in one sweet package. Um, in the six hour training program, in six parts, it includes the seven elements uh, for success in poker and life, and there's also three bonus ones. It includes how to boost motivation, confidence, and energy, which as you can hear tonight, I have a whole lot of. It's got how to create a chip accumulation plan going into day two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then how to adapt that plan as the day goes on and you collect more information. It's got decision-making tactics to protect your tournament life. And it also has my pre-flop and post-flop strategies and the variables that affect them. So as I said earlier, you can know your starting ranges and deviate from them towards ranges that support you, whether it's playing more hands or fewer hands. Uh, so my WSOP winning formula is also a $200 training program, bringing the total value of the Ultimate Grips training bundle to $398. Next up, we have probably my best selling course of all time. Um, it was also the first course that I ever made. So maybe I have a gift for teaching. I don't know. Lucky me. Maybe I found my calling. <laughs> um, this is a 10-part series that explores all aspects of tournaments, both live and online. I, when I made this program, I wanted it to just be complete, where it's just, okay, here's the foundation, you follow this, you know exactly how to approach tournaments and how tournaments are different from sit and goes and how tournaments are different from cash games and what you need to know to get results. It's a 10 part series that begins with introductory lesson, including the mindsets and the main goals for multi-table tournaments. Parts two, three, and four, we go through early, middle, and late stage play. Parts five and six, we go through the five weapons of short stack play and the five weapons of big stack play. Part seven, you can see is much longer than the others because it is the most crucial time of the tournament, which is the final, pay final table, where you'll learn how to move up those payout structures and also how to approach bubble play for the final table and adjust for shorthanded play, which is crucial. In part eight, I talk about satellite strategy and how it differs from regular tournament strategy, so you can get into more events for cheaper buy-ins. Part nine, I talk about massive field tournaments, which is how to adjust those strategies for those high multiplier tournaments, like the World Series of Poker Main Event or the Poker Star Sunday Million. And finally, part 10, which was one of my favorite parts, is live tournaments. Talk about a lot of live reads you can get on your opponents, how to profile your opponents, um, and how to apply everything from the first nine lessons to the live setting as well. So this was kind of my introduction into live tournaments and then my live MTT winning system 
and my WSOP winning formula are where I go deeper on live play. Uh, all told, this is a four hour training program. Um, so you're going to get my live MTT winning system, $200 value, my WSOP winning formula, $200 value, and the MTT video guide, $100 value. Your total value today, $497. We got a little bit more. There's a little bit more for um, my cash game players out there. And also because tournament poker is similar to cash games, it's just got a couple extra variables. So the cash game guide is uh, an ebook that includes everything you need to know to play poker like a pro. This is the second book. It's the second book that I wrote, and I wrote it after Jonathan Little had invited me to write a chapter in Excelling at No Limit Hold'em. I wrote kind of the intro there, chapter one, the triple threat, the six ingredients for a winning for, for a winning recipe for poker, and I realized I wanted to write more. I wanted to write more about pre-flop. I wanted to write about post-flop. I wanted to write about equity. I wanted to write about, you know how to really think about situations and bet sizing. And so I just kept writing. I wrote the one chapter for Jonathan and I just kept writing. And this ebook was the result. Um, so this extensive ebook, the cash game guide will teach you the fundamentals and understandings of successful cash game play. This is a result of me playing cash games full time as my primary source of income for, oh wow, what was it? About eight years and also studying tons of videos during that time. Everything on card runners, everything on run at once, everything on blue fire poker back when that was a thing, deuces cracked, I watched them all. I even took a $5,000 training program from Aaron Jones and Lucky Chewy and I bought a $1,000 ebook from Cole South, Let There Be Range because that's what you had to pay for information back then. And this, this ebook distills all that information from those programs, plus the training videos I watched, plus my firsthand experience. So it's really awesome. And I really enjoyed writing this book. So Cash Game Guide is $20 value, uh, which adds to the bundle. You got the live MTT winning system, my WSP winning formula, the MTT video guide, and the Cash Game Guide. Total value, $516. Next, we have my first ebook, which was the multi-table tournament guide. Um, and if you've been looking for a comprehensive kick-ass guide to winning poker tournaments, look no further. Uh, this has everything you need to become a great tournament player. It's included in this MTT guide. This was the guide I created for people who didn't feel they were ready to afford in the video MTT guide. They didn't think they could justify it. So I made this program that included a lot of the key concepts for how to think about tournament play and made it much more accessible at, uh, you know, $9 price. Um, so... We add that to the mix. You got two eBooks to go with the three video training programs. And finally, I'm adding one more thing to the Ultimate Grips Bundle, which is the Bankroll Building Bible. This is my most recent eBook that I wrote um, just around January, just around January. So it's a recent one, uh, 2019 edition. And it's the 12 commandments for building the bankroll you know you deserve. And the reason I wrote this book is because, well, I realized that, well, a lot of people, I, had the, I was giving them the strategies and they knew how to play the game well. I was getting a lot of emails about people saying, you know, they were building up their bankroll and then busting it. And I realized people were playing too aggressively with their bankroll and they weren't, they just weren't respecting the importance of bankroll management because they didn't realize how critical it was to success. And that's why I made it the first lesson in the first course I ever did on YouTube is because it's the most important thing and it's what was missing. Um, your bankroll is your lifeblood in poker and to honor it is all important. So, um, you know, when you're playing outside your bankroll, you're flirting with going busto every single session. It's a very stressful, very intense way to play. And if you can't keep your bankroll together, then you might as well not even bother with learning poker strategy because all the poker strategy in the world is not going to save you if your um, bankroll management strategy isn't in place. But if you can keep starting bankroll together, then you can apply the teachings of all the other trainings in the program and you can win big. So the bankroll building Bible truly is the foundation that all other knowledge should be built upon. And it's, it's a great read. It's like 50 pages, super quick, super breezy. You can blaze through it in like a couple hours. And so I'm adding that to the bundle. So what you're going to get, the complete grips ultimate 
MTT bundle includes the live MTT winning system, $199 value. My World Series of Poker winning formula, $199 value. The MTT video guide, $99 value. The cash game guide, $19 value. The multi-table tournament guide, a $9 value. The bankroll building Bible, $9 value. Total value of $534. This is what these courses all sell for in my store. Now, let me ask you a question. If all this did, this program, was give you a solid grasp of the fundamentals of poker and tournament poker, would it be worth it? And if all this did was help you make just one deep run in your local $100, $200, $500, $1,000 main event and get deeper in the payout structure and make more money, would it be worth it? And if all this program did was help you play with more confidence, focus, and energy so that you can play your A game more often and have the energy to hop back in there the next day to play the next tournament, would it be worth it? I see we got some yeses in the chat. We got some, of course. So, you know, that's, that's why I put this together because I realized, you know, as much as I love my programs, I think they're great. Um, one thing was missing and it was that they weren't all together. And so that's why I'm really thankful to Jonathan and the guys at Poker Coaching Premium who suggested that I put everything together and just put it in one solid package so that it just covers all the bases. Um, so it's back to, back to school season and I want to see you get back to stacking. So that's why today in partnership with pokercoaching.com, most grateful to them. We are offering this bundle, the grips ultimate MTT bundle, which includes the live MTT winning system, $200 value, my WSP winning formula, $200 course, MTT video guide, hundred dollar course, Cash Game Guide, $20 ebook, Multi Table Tournament Guide, $10 ebook, and the Bankroll Building Bible, $10 ebook. Total value, $534. Um, and you can get everything now for just $99. Um, that's $435 in saving. That's over 80% off the price that I normally charge for these courses. And I think, I think I could be wrong. Uh, but I think they may even have some more bonus items at the website. Uh, so if you check out pokercoaching.com forward slash grips bundle, uh, you can see the offer and see what other extra items they may have thrown into the mix. Um, and yeah, to get that discount, just use the coupon code grips, G R I P S E D, and you will get the maximum discount. You can get all this for less than a hundred dollars. And that wraps up my presentation. So I am more than happy to field your questions now. If you have any questions or comments, please put them in the chat box and let's get stacking. Okay, Svetlana asks, how do I join your program? Hit up that website, pokercoaching.com forward slash grips bundle. I'm going to have to maximize this question box. There are a lot coming at me. Okay. Um, Kevin says, I am the director of a sales and marketing for a digital media agency. If you ever want to trade professional expertise, please email me. Okay. Um, I'll take a note of your email, Kevin. We'll save that for later. Maybe we can, maybe we can chit chat. Hope you enjoyed my presentation, sir. Okay. 
Okay. Jerry says, folding big blind to a gut shot seems weak and losing out on big implied odds on the flop. Well, okay, so two considerations when it comes to that. If you are dealing with a tight range, then correct. Calling with gut shots is a good idea because you have implied odds and you're likely to get paid. What we were looking at in this presentation was mostly situations where we are facing a wide range and therefore our opponents don't have a hand that's likely to pay us off when we make our hand. Um, in, in, in that case where opponent is very unlikely to have a hand, we're going to make our money by getting them to fold and fold out their equity in the pot, fold out their share of the pot, which is why if we're going to play on with hands, we want to play by check raising. Um, and we only need to continue with strong. We, we can bluff with all our weekends and call with all our strong hands. Whereas if our opponent has a very strong range, by all means, it's fine to fast play our strong hands and slow play our weak hands, you know, take one off. But if we don't hit our hand on the turn and our opponent doesn't give us a free river, generally it's going to be correct to check fold on the turn because the price is too expensive. So again, implied odds depend on how strong your opponent's range is and how likely they are to make a big hand when you make your hand or how likely they are to already have a big hand. In the absence of those being true, uh, most of your money is gonna come from either check raising them off their hands or just floating and then taking it away on later streets. Um, yeah, but then we're not playing for the implied odds, we're just playing for uh, our bluff equity. Omar says, gotta go win this tourney, thanks coach. Well, I guess he'll catch this on the replay. You're welcome, brother. I hope you took what you learned. You went out there and you got stacking. Douglas says, hey, Evan, does this method help you in cash games? Thanks for all your info. Very helpful. Yes, Douglas, this stuff definitely applies to cash games. So the stuff we talked about on bubble factor does not apply to cash games because bubble factor is not a thing. But the stuff we talked about on the defending frequency from the blinds and what percentage of hands to continue post-flop definitely apply. So if you take that chart for no anti uh, defense frequencies, uh, that applies completely. And also, well, the reshove stuff would only come into play if you're playing against a short stack, which there aren't a ton of. Um, but also just the equity in general, yes. And the stuff about fighting the uphill battle, yes. Um, I, I cover a lot more of this in my triple threat series. Um, but yeah, uh, the position stuff applies completely. The minimum defense frequencies apply completely. The only thing that doesn't carry over to cash games is the bubble factor stuff and the short stack stuff. Cool. Adam says, what is the best way to play heads up? Um, get to know your opponent very well, profile your opponent, and then try to figure out the best strategy to play against them. Uh, I remember I watched a training series on Deuces Cracked by Jay Rosencrantz back when he was crushing uh, the Heads Up Games. Uh, a series was called Printy Rating, and he basically profiled every single opponent that was the different types you'd run into and how, how to beat them, you know, how to trap them, how to put pressure on them, and all that good stuff. And I don't think that series is around anymore because, well, the site got sold and, and went under. But fortunately, when I made my first course on YouTube, um, the How to Win a Poker Complete course, which is completely free, uh, I have I included a section on the five different player types you're going to run into and how to play against them. And uh, a lot of the information carried over. So I would study the five videos I have on how to play against nits, tags, lags, uh, mice, and loose passive players. And then I would just practice a lot if I were you, Adam. Um, the best way to learn how to do something is to practice it and then study and practice and study and practice and study. So just get a lot of reps in, play some small stakes where you're comfortable with the money that you're risking, and then you'll be able to think about things from a strategic perspective as opposed to kind of getting wrapped up in emotions, which is what happens um, when we play um, for too much money. So hope that helps. All right, Richard. Recreational player. Three betting from the big blind versus late two to three X rays. I know what I should do, but fail to execute because of the mental aspect of poker, what I call the walk of shame. Yes. Knocked out of a turning before cashing. Yes. This thought impacts negatively. 
Yes. My play when to find my big blind versus three betting. Yes. When conditions indicate I should three bet just completing any insight to overcome this state of mind. Yes. Richard, I love this question. So I have a question for you. You don't need to answer it in the chat. You can just think about it. Do you play poker to feel good? Do you play poker to make friends? Or do you play poker to make money? And regardless of what the answer to that question is, next question is, if it were a perfect world, would you play poker to have fun, to make friends, or to make money? And if the answer is to make money, even if it's not now, but it's what it would be in a perfect world, then that gives you the motivation to move towards that. And the real key to getting this result is to take the ego and emotions away from the game. Um, ego can get us into a lot of trouble. That's where we overplay hands, blind versus blind, because we're thinking it's a one-on-one -on -one battle and people are testing our wits, but it's, it's a math game and it's numbers. And when we can take the emotions out of it, the fear of what's gonna happen, the fear of the feeling, then we can make the best decisions. And we also know that you know feelings come and go, but results are, are permanent. And you know you you can think of you know the the walk of shame, the fear of what's it going to feel like if I have to walk out and people see I didn't cash. But what would it feel like if you won? What would it feel like if if your three bet got through? What would it feel like there? And you know humans. Negative feelings are stronger than positive feelings. So we're more fearful of doing something that hurts than moving towards something that feels good, which is why it's better to just take the emotions out of it altogether. But it is worth considering the other side of the coin too. So the best advice I can give is to just do everything you can to cut the emotions out of it. And remember that you're playing a card game, you're playing a betting game, you're playing a math game, and your job is to make the best mathematical decisions as possible. And if at the end of the day, you go home having made as many correct mathematical decisions as possible, you'll be happy. You'll feel good about yourself. You'll feel proud of your performance because you know you did the right thing. And when you start doing that, you can separate yourself from the financial results of whether you won or lost. And in the short run, it may mean you cash less, but in the long run, it will mean that you make a lot more money because tournaments are a long run game that require taking chances, going for it and gambling. And if you're not willing to take some risk, well, that's okay too. But then you'd probably be better off, you know, playing tennis or, or, um, you know, golf than poker. And, and that's the things to consider. So I hope that helps. I hope that gives you a few things to think about, a few things to look at. Um, the main piece of advice though is just call a spade a spade. Poker is a math game. It's not a test of, you know, who's the man or who can feel the best or some emotional thing. It's, it's just a math game. Um, and we're trying to take advantage of other people's psychology as opposed to letting our own psychology take advantage of us. And uh, when you do that, you'll feel good because, hey, hey brother, it's more fun when you win. And when you're playing like that, you're gonna win more often. Adam asks, is it possible to get a copy of this webinar? Uh, I'm not sure. I would speak to the guys at uh, Poker Coaching. Uh, email support at pokercoaching.com to ask them. Uh, they often put up the replays. So my guess would be yes, but I can't say with 100% certainty. So I would email them to find out, Adam. Granville says, thanks. Several really good points. Several are not intuitive. Thanks, brother. I completely agree. The software is really just what blew my mind. Uh, when I saw the numbers in front of me, I'm like, okay, well, I can argue with opinions and ideas, but I can't argue with mathematics and numbers. And when I saw, I'm just like, okay, this is, this is the way, this is the correct way to play. And it's when I started playing that way, uh, fall of 2015, that I really started getting results. Uh, if you look at my online results from fall 2015 onward, you'll see they are a lot better than they were prior to. Um, JP Budget Joe says, how do you handle multiple four to one favorite losses in a row that destroys your MTT stack? I remind myself that S H I T happens. 
And then I put myself in a state to remember how lucky I am to even be getting to play this game in the first place. And I get into a state of gratitude and I put myself into a positive state. Because obviously losing those things is frustrating and disappointing and it's not fun and it's easy to get into a negative um, thought pattern as a result of it. You know, entitlement comes in. I deserve to win that pot. I'm playing great. I should get all these results. That's, that's fair to think that way. Um, but being in a negative mindset doesn't serve you in the long run. So I just immediately revert back to a state of gratitude and I, I put things in perspective that even if things aren't going great in this tournament, I'm still in the tournament. I still have a chance to play. I'm still doing well enough in life that I get to play poker at all, live in a country where, you know, poker's legal in live settings. And, um, and I realize, you know, I've got things pretty good. And I say, okay, what's my stack size? What's my situation? What's my position? What's my play? And I play from there. And I always just bring myself back to what is my stack size? What is my position in the field? What is my position on the table? What are my cards? I go through my preflop checklist and I, I get to work. Uh, by the way, if you haven't heard about my preflop checklist, search it up on YouTube. It's my most watched video of all time, 420,000 views or something. And it is the factors to consider other than your cards. In fact, prior to your cards before uh, entering a pot and deciding what you want to play. So hope that helps JP, Budget Joe. And I can also say, I feel you. I feel you. It's, it's not enjoyable. It's not fun, but it's part of what we sign up for. And um, being able to be resilient in those situations when other people are not able to be resilient in those situations is going to give you another edge in the long run because it's not how you do day to day that matters. It's how you do relative to the other players if they were in the same situation as you. And if you play a situation, be it a card situation or a mental game situation, better than your opponents would have in the same situation, in the long run, you'll gain. Because one day you're going to win multiple four to one underdog situations in a row. And the guy across the table might not be able to deal with it. And he'll blow off some extra chips. But you, my friend, won't. Um, so take, take the long view and reconnect with gratitude. Okay. Daniel says, as a regular member, non-member PC, do I already have access to these? No. No. These are all... Um, these are all products from my website, grips.com, that um, the guys at Poker Coaching reached out and said, hey, do you want to part do a partnership? Do you want to offer your stuff to our community? I said 100% love the Poker Coaching community. I've had nothing but good experiences since I started doing videos for them. And so we put together this package of all my uh, old products and new products, the mix of the, the olds and the news. Um, so as a Poker Coaching Premium member, you'll have access to my series, The Triple Threat, um, my three-part series, The Triple Threat, which is like an hour-long webinar each on position, selection, and aggression. But um, for non-premium, I don't think you have access to that. And premium or non-premium, um, no, one, no one is gifted access to these. That was one part of the deal was I gave them permission to sell this stuff in their store, but they couldn't just give it away because I worked really hard to create these products and um, you know, I need to be supported for the effort I put in so I can put food on the table and pay my rent and buy into my tournaments, <laughs> go on my trips, whatever it is that I feel so inclined to do, get my massages, talk to my therapist, um, visit my parents, visit my sister, help pay for my nephew's school, things like that. So um, that was the deal we set up. And um, so they're going to be available in store, but they will not be part of uh, the memberships. Kevin says, loved it. I've been grinding and learning and cashing lately, but no, I am leaving much money behind. I bubble way too much in tourneys or main cash due to playing too tight. Well, Kevin, I'm really glad you tuned in today. I hope that bubble stuff was really eye-opening for you and made sense and showed you both how to play the bubble when you're the short stack, but how to take advantage of other people when they're the short stack. And that's the real beauty of it is when you know how to play the big stack, you take advantage of that opportunity when it comes. You're not always going to have a big stack, but at least when you do, you'll make the most of the opportunity. And when you're short or micro stack, you'll also make the most of that opportunity too, even if it just means min caching as opposed to not caching. Because, you know, all those min caches add up too. David asks, will you be making this available to download as a podcast to listen to? Also interested in what you do on break that you see as vital. My routine is to go to the restroom and that's it. Yeah, um, that's where 
It's not included in this pack, but I believe in the membership, the course I did with Jonathan is included. Um, a life-changing score, the hand-by-hand -hand recap of my WPT run. That one, I've got everything I do on breaks, pre-game, post-game, and during the game as well. So check that out. If you're already a member, you may have access to that. I'm not 100%. Um, but if not, I'll see... I'll see if maybe Dan can like throw it in as like a bonus or something with this program so you can get that. Cause like, man, the, the break time routine is everything that 10 to 15 to 20 minutes is so precious. Uh, it's very important to just clear your mind and process everything that happened earlier on. So you can go in fresh as opposed to carrying accumulated emotions or tilt or frustration. And so I find it's very important to get away from uh, other people and just, just relax. Sometimes talking to myself is a way to kind of talk through my thoughts and get it out. But I find if I go and talk to other people, um, then I just have their crap in my head too. And I don't want that. So Jonathan and I rapped about that for about 20 minutes in the five pillars of peak performance poker too. Um, and it's really helpful. And then the dinner breaks, just an even bigger one. Like my secret weapon on dinner breaks is taking a nap and then uh, meditation and intention setting. And I, I go through that deeply in that program. So, so definitely check it out. Um, a uh, life-changing tournament score. Nazareth asks, how do you calculate your big blinds post ante for things like push fold or using M, just the big blind amount or something else? Um, I generally do, I kind of check in on my M every orbit. And then just for ease, I just count how many big blinds that I have. I just find it's an easier thing to keep track of. Um, yeah, I just do that. And then I try to keep a, a loose idea of what everyone else's stack is. So definitely on breaks, I'll count everyone else's stack on the table. So I have that baseline and then I'll pay attention during the level to, um, you know, see who's chipping up or who's chipping down. So I have a general idea of kind of where everyone's at. Um, yeah, I just find keeping track of big blinds is easiest. And the more frequently you do it, uh, it's very helpful because it ensures you're keeping your head in the game. It keeps you very present. Any activity you can do that involves, you know, keeping track of something keeps your mind in the game, keeps you attentive. And that's, um, that's what's going to keep you sharp and making better decisions than your opponents. Granville asks, any notable differences to small casino daily tourneys that are very fast structured or changes? Yeah, in those tournaments where um, the structure is very fast, um, there's a lot of incentive to play more aggressively to try to build a bigger stack early because when the structure inevitably speeds up and everyone ends up really short on the bubble, people get really short in those things, you have an opportunity to just pick up so many chips by just uh, raising the blinds and applying that pressure on the bubble. So since the bubble factor is really high, there's a lot of incentive to building up a big stack early. Um, and then the other adjustment in those tournaments, if you have not built a big stack, is that caching is often gonna be fairly valuable relative to winning because the multiplier is low. Typically, you know, you get a tournament of 50 or 100 people, top prize is not gonna be hundreds of buy-ins. So caching has more value than it would uh, you know, in a tournament with a thousand people, but because they get so shallow, uh, I like to take advantage of those early levels to play a lot of hands and try to build a stack, especially if it's a re-entry tournament, because having chips when everyone else is shallow and everyone else is correctly playing to cash is an opportunity to just pick up a stack through, uh, just min raising the blinds that will allow you to cruise to the final table. And, um, you know, get to that deal-making portion of the tournament. Also, the fact that people are more willing to make deals in uh, tournaments like that means making the final table or making the top five um, with just an average stack or a small stack is more valuable than it would be in a bigger tournament, a tougher field tournament where people aren't as inclined to chop because suddenly just getting to fifth might get you an even chop. Whereas in another tournament, you know, you get to fifth, five-handed left with a short stack, you're not gonna get a favorable deal. Um, so those are the adjustments I offer you, Granville. Carlos says, I had queens and 40 blinds and a big MTT four days ago. Day one, I raised two opponents call. Flop was low cards. I see bet both call. Turn was small card again. No big draws in place. I bet larger. One opponent full and a young regular shoved 70 blinds. I folded, but I don't. Th but I think I was exploited. What do you think? Um. Well, generally... The hands that people are going to call flop and raise turn as a bluff with, especially for a big shove, is going to be draws. 
open end straight draws, flush draws, and more often it's going to be combo draws. Uh, if someone's shoving 70 blinds um, after calling a C-bet, you're raising early. Okay, first off, it's a multi-way pot, so he's calling with a stronger range. He's not calling with nothing. And he's calling your flop bet and then shoving over your turn bet. I would definitely guess the guy had a set, set or two pair. If there's no draws possible, what else can he have? He's not going to do that with top pair. He's not going to do that with the gutter. Uh, it's a spot where I would just check the ego, uh, drop the entitlement. If I had a big pair, I'm supposed to win. Or if I have to fold a big pair, I probably got exploited. Just sometimes it's correct to fold a big pair. And when you're facing a line of someone who's calling you and then shoving on you or calling, calling, and then shoving on you, they can usually beat one pair when they do that. It's more like if you're shallow stacked and you raised and he shoved over your C bet, now he might just have top pair. But when he calls and then shoves, especially in a multi-way pot, he probably has it. Um, people have much stronger hands in multi-way pots than they do in heads up pots. So I would guess that you made the correct fold, Carlos, uh, with the information you gave me. Uh, Svetlana, I just purchased your program. Thank you. Is it online or will I get the books? Uh, you will get download links for the books or they will be available in your members area. I'm not sure how Dan's delivering it. It's one or the other. And the video programs, the three video programs will be available in your members area um, in the poker coaching membership. So thank you for the support, Svetlana. I really appreciate that. And I hope you enjoy the content. Feel free to send me an email, evan at gripst.com after you've had a chance to go through the material to uh, let me know your thoughts on it and let me know what shifts you've seen in your game as a result of going through it. Chuck asks, what is a mice player? A mice player is a tight and passive player. Also, you know, kind of a weak type player. They play very few hands, but even then they um, fold them, fold more hands than they should. Kind of uh, the over defender type we talked about on the um, blind defense section. Arlene says, understanding being attentive to opponents play from hand to hand. Is there more specific details that we determine an opponent's opening frequency? Yeah. Um, yeah, I talk about that in my winning formula for sure. Uh, I also talk about that in part 10 of the MTT guide where I talk about the live players. Um, the way someone dresses is going to give away something. Their mannerisms is going to give away something. And, you know, generally their inclinations towards action. Are they watching sports? Are they engaging in risky behavior like drinking, smoking cigarettes on breaks? Things like that shows a bit more risk inclination. Uh, another really helpful thing to do is just pay attention to showdowns. And when you see what hand someone open from a certain position, mark that down. Because if someone opens, say, um, I don't know, 6-5 uh, suited under the gun, you can believe they're opening 6-7 suited, 8-7 suited, 9-8 suited from under the gun as well. If someone opens uh, king five suited in the hijack or the low jack, you can believe that they're opening all suited kings from that position. If you see someone call a raise from early position, in early position with six three suited, you can guess they're playing all suited connectors and suited gappers, I mean. So, or if someone like calls a raise with ace two offsuit or they open ace five offsuit in middle position, that's a big thing to note. So note the hands you see at showdown. And when you see a hand that's really low, just assume they're raising that and everything above that as well. And you'll slowly be able to profile just how wide someone's opening frequency is. And you'll also be able to notice if they're positionally aware. Are they playing, it seems like, any suited hand from any position? Cool. They're an extremely loose, maniacal player. Are they showing down, you know, 9-2 suited but only on the button and under the gun, they seem pretty tight. Okay, they're positionally aware and they're just widening the range in position as opposed to just playing wide from all positions. So pay attention to what hands they're showing down, but also what position they're opening from. And that will help you determine their baseline opening frequency. And from there, you know, just, just observe your opponents and the information will come. Um, Kay says, thank you, sir. You are welcome. Joel James says, thanks for the dedication and taking time to do this webinar. You're welcome. Richard says, something to do. Retired, fun, then woot woot. Helps a lot. Thanks. You're welcome, brother. Okay, okay. You're answering the questions. There you go. Dollars. All right, Richard, your minimum defense frequency and frequency to continue, as example, using Flotilla is drastically lower than what JL teaches, which is usually close to continuing 70% remaining range on each street, usually including backdoor draws, not speak many pairs. Your teaching seems to be in contradiction to JL's and Miller's approach. Um, Richard, that was giving you a 
baseline, just like maximum safety perspective. It's if you go all the way there, you're going to be okay. Um, now, what they're referring to with going that 70% continuing from flop to turn to river and all that is assuming you're facing a half pot to a pot size bet where you're getting good odds on the flop and you're getting good odds on the turn. So you can defend a good portion of your range and you're still going to be doing fine. What I was showing is that very, very minimum, just based on what you continued with pre-flop with the odds to get to the flop is still going to be fine. And what they're showing you with that 70% defend is basically the other side of the spectrum, which is how loose you can defend with it still being profitable. So they showed you the loose end of the spectrum. I showed you the tight end of the spectrum. And if you play anywhere in the middle of that spectrum, you're going to be doing fine and you're going to be seeing a profit. Um, I'll double check with Jonathan to be sure, because um, I know his approach and I know Miller's report approach. I've gone through his course, Poker's 1%, as well as his book. Um, so I'll have a convo with him, but I'm quite confident that theirs is the as loose as possible approach without it being too loose, and mine is the as tight as possible approach without it being too tight, and anything in the middle of that is just fine. Carlos says, do you do private coaching? Does it include technical and mind coaching? How much do you charge? Thank you. Yes, I do private coaching. All the information is available on my website, gripst.com, G-R-I-P-S-E-D.com forward slash coaching. Uh, I do 45 minute sessions for $100 and 90 minute sessions for $200. So typically the first sessions, 45 minutes. We kind of go through everything you need. I give you an intake form. You answer all these questions. We get clear on your goals, what you want from poker, how I can best serve you, whether it's in mental game coaching or strategic coaching, um, pointing in the directions of programs that will support you in your study practice. And then you decide if you want to do one hour sessions or two hour sessions. And we rock with that. And also if you're interested in doing multiple sessions, like buying a five pack of sessions, I also do offer a discount for that. And for more info on that, you can just email me, uh, Evan, E-V-A-N, at gripsed, G-R-I-P-S-E-D, dot com. Okay. Daniel says, well, buy this as many points resonate to my game. Thanks, Daniel. Appreciate the support, brother. Um, means a lot, man. Thank you. Granville, cool. All your material I have experienced has been valuable. Thanks, brother. You are welcome, Granville. Thanks for tuning into all the webinars, man. It's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, Douglas also asked, do you do private coaching? As I mentioned just a minute ago, the answer is yes. Nazareth, thanks for everything, Evan. You are welcome. Chuck, do you include antes in calculating number of big blinds? No. Um, I just count my number of big blinds. And yeah, I don't factor it in. Um, if I'm doing M and I want to get really tight with my ranges, then, you know, I would include the ante in there to figure out what my M is. But at this point, I've looked at so many shove charts and played so many short stacks in online tournaments that I have a pretty good feel for what I can shove with from all the positions, uh, ranging from, you know, five blinds up to 30 blinds. Because, you know, you can open shove a pair of twos for 30 blinds on the button. You might not always want to do it, but you can show some profit. Um, does the 10 part MTT video guide include now common big blind anti structure? Um, no, when I made the MTT video guide, big blind anti didn't exist, but the size of the anti is still the same. So in terms of adjusting to anti versus non anti, the information is going to carry over. It's just assuming that everyone puts in a, uh, 0.1 BB anti, which back in the day would have been called a large anti. JP says, really appreciate your time. It was very much worth it. Thanks for tuning in, man. Appreciate it. It was a pleasure to do this. Arlene, thank you very much. You are most welcome. Uh, Graham Bell, just noticing who is position sensitive and valuable every additional piece of it. Man, all the information counts. Every little bit adds up. That's what makes all the difference in this game. The more you pay attention, the more information you have, the more of an advantage you have over your opponents and the more money you're going to make. It's just that simple. Uh, Richard says, thank you. I'll be purchasing your bundle. You are welcome, brother. And thank you so much for the support. Really hope you enjoy the material, man. It's 
it's fun and it's got the same kind of energy, the same kind of vibe that you got in tonight's presentation. I just, I just love teaching poker. I love teaching. I love this game. I've just got so much knowledge that I love to share. And like, this, this is what I do it for is because there are people out there like yourself who um, are as excited to learn it as I was when I first found it. And, you know, I get to be the excited teacher that, uh, you know, I wish I had when I started out. Adam says, often have trouble figuring out what hands to three bet light and when to three bet for value. Is it mainly opponent based, position based, and hand based? Okay, so first consideration is what is their opening range and what is their continuing range to a three bet because that determines how often your three bet's going to work. If they're folding to your three bet more than 67% of the time and you don't have anyone left tack behind you, you know, like they open the small blind, you're in the big blind, you could technically three bet any two cards because you're gonna succeed with your three bet often enough based on the math. Um, but because often we're three betting from the button, because we wanna be in position, we have a couple hands that can ambush us. Small blind and big blind can wake up. So we wanna be a little bit tighter. You know, we don't wanna go as wide as any two cards. Um, also, if your opponent is, you know, calling the three bet 50% of the time, uh, they're, you know, or they're continuing 75% of the time. Now you're gonna need a stronger hand because you're gonna be taken to the streets playing post flop more often. So first thing is, what's their opening range? Second is, what's their continuing range? So how often are they going to fold? When they continue, what hands do they continue with? Next consideration is, when they continue, do they continue by calling or do they continue by forbidding? If they continue by calling, you want hands that flop really well. Um, you know, your suited connectors, suited broadways, big hands. Uh, if they continue by forbidding or folding, then three betting with blockers becomes a lot of value you know, three betting with an ace-x hand or a king-queen hand because they're only going to four bet you with those premium hands and blockers, jacks plus, ace-king, and typically the ace-x blocker. So if you have an ace blocker, they're less likely to have an ace in their hand, so they're less likely to four bet you, so your three bet's going to work more often. So you have the, the, the way your opponent continues determines how you should construct your range. Now, in terms of what hands to three bet, um... You know, your value hands typically going to be jacks plus ace king is always safe. You might want to widen it to nines plus ace queen and get in with that against super wide players who will like three bet and then five bet with like pairs. You can you can do it with uh, ace. You can do it sevens plus and ace jack for value king queen suited. And in terms of the hands you want to bluff with, uh, typically the best candidates are your your suited wheel aces, ace two, ace three, ace four, ace five suited. Um, you're suited broadways because they flop well. So, you know, jack 10 suited, queen 10 suited, king 10 suited, king jack suited, things like that. And um, some suited connectors are okay. 10 9 suited, 9 8 suited, 8 7 suited, 7 6 suited. You generally don't want to go too far down. Um, if you're dealing with opponents who are continuing to your three bet by four betting or folding, you know, king jack is okay blockers, king queen's great blockers. Ace jacks, great blockers. Ace queens, great blockers. Ace tens, even okay blockers. Uh, but you don't really have to take it too wide. You know, you can be using your better pairs, your your better broadways, king queens, ace jack plus, your suited broadways, your suited aces, and, and that's going to get you a pretty wide range. You know, you could be using just those. You're easily hitting a 15% three bet. And that's already pretty wide. Um, the, the general consideration when you're kind of constructing a range preflop is often you want to three bet with your best hands. You want to call with your next best hands. You want to then three bet with the hands that are not quite good enough to call with, but too good to fold. And then you want to fold everything else. So you can ask yourself, what is the worst hand I feel comfortable getting it all in with after I three bet? That's the bottom of your three betting for value range. Um, what is the best hand that I don't quite feel is good enough to call a raise with? Maybe it's ace nine suited, king nine suited, um, I don't know, six five suited, king ten off, queen jack off. And then you three bet those as a bluff, and then you fold everything else. Um, so that's kind of a way you can construct your uh, three betting range so that you're not three betting your worst hands, but you're also not three betting the hands that are good enough to continue with by calling. Um, so maybe I could do a whole lesson on that one time. Currently I don't have one, but that's, that's kind of the theory behind it. So, um, yeah, the factors are your opponent's range, your opponent's range for continuing, how your opponent continues, 
um, which determines what hands you should have, and then whether you're in position or out of position, and then how deep the stacks are. Those are like the five considerations to um, constructing your three betting range. Okay. Uh, how about where big blind ante is in play? I don't quite understand that question. Douglas says, Evan, thank you. You are the best. I always learn a lot from listening to you. Thank you again. You are so welcome, Douglas, man. Thanks for tuning in and thanks for this comment in all capitals. I can tell just how excited you are, man. Like, this is awesome. Thank you. Uh, thanks again. And Carlos says, thank you for your answers. I asked the question about private mind and poker coaching and my sound stopped working exactly. We answered it. Would you mind repeating again? Thank you. Sure, Carlos. No problem. Uh, I do offer coaching for both poker and mental game and just lifestyle coaching. My rates are $100 for a 45-minute session, which is typically what the first session is, and then uh, $200 for hour and a half sessions. Um, so typically what we do is we have the first session, 45-minute session, which also involves I send you a questionnaire. You fill out the questionnaire. It's got your goals, your dreams, your vision, what you want to get from poker, how you want to get there, how committed you are, who can support you, what your obstacles are going to be, all the important stuff. And then I read through that in my off time in preparation for the session. So while our first session is 45 minutes, really it's more like an hour and a half because I do all the prep work to read your form and kind of figure out a game plan. Um, then we talk through that in the first session, determine um, if the best course of action is to have multiple sessions with me, if you'd be better off working with another coach for specific areas, if you want to be studying training material, if you want to practice by playing or you want to use the tools, whatever it is, we kind of map out that plan. And then the follow-up sessions, typically I do 90-minute sessions for the follow-ups, but people are more than welcome to just book quickies if they just want a 45-minute here and there. And for multiple sessions, if you book five or more, I do also offer discounts. So full information about that is available at gripst.com forward slash coaching, or you can email me at evan, E-V-A-N, at gripst.com, G-R-I-P-S-E-D.com. Um, and as I mentioned, I'm a certified yoga teacher, meditation instructor, holistic life coach, as well as a very experienced poker player. And I've also gone through every uh, mental game training program out there on the market and read every book and listen to every book, Mental Game of Poker. So um, you'll, you'll be in good hands, 100%. Okay. Adam says, thanks again, brother. You have a great skill at teaching and simplifying the concepts. Thanks, Adam. I really appreciate that, man. It means a lot. It means a lot. I do feel like this is kind of what I'm supposed to be doing in life. So it's an honor to get to do it and share it with so many great people like yourselves. Um, okay. Do we have any more questions? We're way over time, as usual. Two hours and 10 minutes. Great show. A little bit of marathon right here. Um, so I'll open the floor for just kind of last questions or comments if anyone wants to share. And uh, if we don't, we'll wrap it up. And if we do, you know, we can hang for about five more minutes. I think then I should probably get some sleep, 10, 15, getting past my bedtime. And I don't want to keep my roommate up, you know. Got to be considerate. Um, Chuck says, FYI, not a question, just FYI, $99 is the maximum amount that my budget can afford. Okay. Social security, respect. Also, I think that I already purchased one of the included products. Can't find it right now. I haven't decided, but I'll probably purchase your bundle. Great webinar. You demand. Thanks, Chuck. Thanks, Chuck. I can say, I mean, even if you've got one of them, um, the discount's just so absolutely massive that you're still getting like incredible savings by uh, taking advantage of this bundle. Like I've, I've never offered it at this price ever. Like they, they suggest, I'm like, man, I don't know, man. That's a big discount. Like I've just trust us, man. The most, the most important thing is not making the most money from every product you sell. It's getting as many people as possible to have your content so that they can learn from it and get results and give you feedback so you can make more content that will help them. And I'm like, okay, that's, that makes sense. Um, but normally like the biggest sale, the biggest sale ever is like the world series of a poker sale. We do like 50% off. So it'd still be like two, what would it be? 267. So 99 is just like massive discount. I'm, I'm still kind of shocked, but I'm like, yeah, it's, it's a great deal. How do you turn it on a steal? It's a great deal. So, and that's, 
it's kind of, if I want to teach as many people as possible, I should give as good of a deal as possible, right? So that's what we did here. And um, thanks, Chuck. I appreciate the support, brother. Granville says, sign of great teachers to make profound, simple, the simple profound. Yes. Thanks much. You are welcome, Joseph. Thank you very much. Everything was very helpful. Greets from Brazil. Greets, Carlos. And uh, adios. Night, Richard. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, Mike says, how many current coaching clients do you have? I'm just working with like three or four guys right now. I keep my schedule pretty light. Um, doing a lot of work on Gripst, getting Gripst up and running, um, building that out. Also doing a lot of work, getting my socials going, Instagram, YouTube, getting back on the YouTube grind. So my priority is really reaching as many people as possible. And I do love private coaching, but it also... It's a big investment of time, and that's actually why I started with YouTube, was that I thought if I do one hour of coaching with someone, my one hour becomes one hour of value for someone else. But if I do a YouTube video and a thousand people see it, my one hour of work became a thousand hours of value. And that's why um, you know, I felt that doing the YouTube approach and doing the course approach and doing the mass approach was, was more valuable to everyone in the long run. It was a greater net gain. So that's my focus. Um, I'll pretty much never turn down a client if they come my way and I think it's a good investment for them. Um, sometimes after the first session, it turns out poker's not the best thing for people. So I've also like encouraged a lot of people to um, you know, focus on more important things in their life. So we do one session, that's kind of it. Um, but I'm always, I'm always happy to do coaching sessions, but I don't push it hard you know i'm not out there promoting my coaching trying to get tons of signups because i actually like working on the courses and the social media and stuff and reaching a wider audience and doing webinars like this so so my coaching numbers they're not very high um but yeah i'm, I'm completely fine with that nazareth says your passion for teaching us is inspiring thank you again you are welcome sir kev says keep rocking it is it always worth five betting AK in cash tourney games? No, no. Sometimes it is not worth five betting AK in cash tourney games. I uh, I blew off five thousand dollars in a five ten game because there was a Mississippi straddle on, and I was living with some tournament players who told me you always got to get in with an, get it in with ace king, especially if it's suited. And uh, you're getting in two hundred fifty blinds. Usually your opponent's going to have kings plus, so you do not just want to get in with ace king. Sometimes you can play it defensively. Actually, if you search how to play ace king grips you'll find a really sweet youtube video on that where i talk about uh the fast plane and the slow plane of ace king and uh when to do each one having a drink for you great lesson thanks douglas okay it says anyone who buys into a table or tourney for a hundred dollars or more should have no problem buying this i guess i guess that's why they pick this price point there's a reason you aren't consistently winning and these lessons will help thanks kev appreciate it man all right bye brother Night, Granville. Thanks for tuning in. Kev says, are you still playing cash games daily? No, 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 no. I'm not playing cash games daily. I go to the casino like once a week, once every two weeks. Um, you know, focusing on the business is my top priority. It takes a lot of time. And um, I found when I try to do multiple things at the same time, both of them suffer. And since I really just want to be the best teacher and the best businessman that I can be, uh, I'm making that my top priority. So I go to the casino you know, once a week, once every two weeks, stay sharp, stay in rhythm, get some reps in, um, get some quizzes for the site. But uh, by no means is cash games my daily grind. I gave that up as my daily grind a long time ago. And um, I gave up my MTTs as my daily grind a couple of years ago after I had the big score and realized, okay, now it's time for me to study up on health and wellness and yoga and, you know, addiction recovery and all these things that I think are essential to, um, you know, the kind of clients who are going to be coming my way so that I can help them in every way possible. I don't want to just be able to help people with their poker game. I want to be able to help them with their life game. And so that required me to immerse myself fully in other areas, which meant less poker. But I felt like I had done well enough in poker that it was okay. And I still feel sharp every time I go because I spend a lot of time studying the content on the side to make sure I'm up to date with the latest trends. And that balance works for me. 
Darren says, thanks, Evan, for all that you do. You're welcome, Darren. And Chuck says, I buying it now. Thanks, Chuck. I think you're going to love the content, man. It's some really awesome stuff. And please, please send me an email after you've had a chance to get through the material. Evan at grips.com, E-V-A-N at G-R-I-P-S-E-D.com. And I would love to hear your feedback on it. And um, if you find there's anything, anything at all I didn't cover in the programs, that you are having trouble with after going through it, please include it in the email and I'll make sure to include it in, uh, you know, the next webinar, the next teaching. Granville says, if you have your life right, you are much more likely to get your poker right. That is exactly it, brother. My motto is feel your best, play your best. And um, right now I feel like I'm doing both. And speaking of which, we're at 1015, boys and girls. It is my bedtime. I'm going to get to sleep so I can keep my circadian rhythm in order. I just want to say thank you so much one more time from the bottom of my heart and the top of my brain for tuning in today. Really hope you enjoy the material you learned a lot from and you can take these tips to your game and apply them immediately. Stop making those three big mistakes and start making those three big moves that are going to make you a whole lot more money. Uh, thanks for tuning in. I'll see you guys for the next webinar. And if you want to get in touch, you can tweet at me at grips poker on Twitter, or just stop by my YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash grips. Um, I'm even actually giving away a free one month membership to poker coaching premium to anyone who leaves a comment on my latest video reviewing Jonathan Little's cash game. So if you want some more free stuff, feel free to drop by there, leave a comment and I'll let you know tomorrow if you're the winner. Um, Carlos says, it possible to go through all this Grips Bundle material and still not make money in poker MTTs? If you actually apply everything in the bundle, it's going to be pretty hard to not make money in MTTs. You just got to put in the volume and apply the science over and over and over. Um, it's not guaranteed because, you know, you got to put in the volume and do things properly, but this is the complete strategy. This is the strategy that will get you the results. It's just a matter of sticking to it and executing it. Execution is everything. And um, that's where you know the mental game coaching that I bring to the table really makes a difference and ensures that you're um, performing at your peak at all times. So, okay, once again, guys, this has been Evan Jarvis for um, pokercoaching.com. Thank you so much for tuning in. It's been such a pleasure and such a joy and an honor sharing this information with you. Look forward to hearing from you and look forward to seeing your pictures, buying a big stack of chips, making those final tables. Hit me up on Twitter at Grips Poker. Look forward to connecting with you and I will see you next time. Until then, you know what to do. Take what you learn, go out there and get stacking. The ultimate Grips MTT bundle is how we can make it happen. Peace out.